Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the meeting of the BART Board of Directors. Today is Thursday, March 14th. Uh, if I could ask um, if we could have the roll called. Thank you, Lewis. Senator Simon? Here. Director Allen? Director Ims? Here. Vice President Foley? Present. Director Lee? Here. Director McPartland? Dr. Raymond? Here. President Dufton? Here. Thank you so very much. Thank we you. do have a quorum. Thank you, sir. And now, if Director Simon could lead Sussman. us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Dr. Sussman. Sussman. Thank you. Welcome everyone to our meeting, and now I'm going to turn it over to Director Simon for introduction of special guests. Well, good morning, everyone. So I'm really excited to introduce two special guests today from the Oakland Ballers. The Oakland Ballers Baseball Association is an organization that I've come to deeply love. They're the newest, and get this, the newest professional sports team in Oakland. Here with us this morning is Paul Friedman, one of the co-founders of the team, and he's the team CEO, and Timothy Cody, who is the Vice President of Business Operations. A big welcome to both of you. You might want to come up to the podium. I'm going to say a few more nice things about you. A big welcome. And we're so proud, so proud of the partnership that Bay Area Rapid Transit has entered into with the Oakland Ballers, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, and I want to thank staff, and I'll I want to shout out Rod Lee and his office for just doing just such an incredible job at bringing BART together with Oakland's newest professional sports team. The Ballers will play their home games in West Oakland, my district, at the historic Ramondi Park, which is only about a mile from the station. With BART being so close to the ballpark, fans will be able to go to the games with a smaller carbon footprint and will have to not deal with the craziness of parking and traffic. Our partnership with the Ballers is such a great example of the many ways that staff have been working hard to increase ridership, whether it be large events in San Francisco, like the St. Patrick's Day Parade, happening this weekend, and partnerships with museums, theaters, sports bars. We know that staff's promotion of trips to amazing and fun events and destinations throughout the beautiful Bay Area are key elements to our rebuilding our ridership. Special thanks, of course, again to Rod Lee and his team, but to Dave and Jill of the BART's marketing team, who've worked so hard to make something that we've never done possible. And our leaders from the Ballers will tell you a little bit more about that in a second. This new partnership is something that we can all be so proud of. And I got to say, in this region, there's so many things that we're saying no to. There's so many issues that we're all trying to tackle from public transportation to safety to housing. The Ballers is an institution that so many of us immediately can say yes to. I don't know a thing about baseball, but when I met with these guys a few months ago, I said, yes, let's do it. And I must say, uh, we are all so absolutely thrilled to have Bart's logo on the Ballers jersey. And wait, before the public and members of the board get to asking questions about how much it cost us, nothing. <laughs> but goodwill and love and the understanding that anything that is good in the Bay Area must be connected to Bay Area Rapid Transit. I want to thank our staff for reaching out and developing this relationship. BART is deeply a part of the lexicon of the Bay Area and partnering with the Bay Area Ballers just signifies again how we can work together in the public and private space. Paul and Timothy, welcome again and I invite you to say a few words about your great work and after, stay up on the podium, uh, we have a special audio announcement. Welcome to Bay Area Rapid Transit. The floor is yours. Um, thank you so much. Uh, um, I'm Paul Friedman. I'm the co-founder of the, the Oakland Ballers. Um, my co-founder and I started the Oakland Ballers on the belief that the unique magic of sports is its ability to bring diverse communities together. And actually, the example we use of that is a BART train. We always use the BART train. I'm not just saying it for this audience. And our example is 
you know, picture yourself on a, on a normal day in a bar train. It's clean, it's on time, <laughs> but people aren't interacting with, with each other. If anything, people are noticing how different they are. You take the same train, and you have it after a Bay Area home team wins the game, and people are high-fiving, they're hugging their family. You know, same people, same train, different context. That's the magic of sports. Uh, part of, the, and, and for Bay Area sports fans, for Oakland sports fans, we know that baseball, of all sports, was the one that brought this community together the most. Uh, Ricky Henderson grew up here. Uh, Dave Stewart grew up here. This, the A's adopted the city colors of green and gold. Um, so the idea that, base, that uh, Oakland would be without baseball was too much for us to bear. So we just decided that um, only Oaklanders should decide our fate with the sport, and we're going to keep baseball here. That was the, the mission, and that's what we're going to do. Um, uh, part of that now, it, uh, as Director Simon mentioned, is activating what we believe is the most historic baseball park in the world, certainly the most historic baseball park in the Bay Area, Romande Park. For those who don't know, Ramande is a beautiful park in West Oakland. It's where Kurt Fled grew up playing. It's where Vita, uh, Vita Pinson grew up playing. Uh, it's, uh, it's where um, Frank Robinson grew up playing. There was once an article in the Oakland Times written that said more professional baseball players have gotten their start at Ramande Park than any other park in the country. Uh, it's, however, recently it's, it's a park that's seen some tough times. Um, and, but what we intend to do in partnership with the community is use the level of baseball the love of community to activate that park, uh, and that's what we're doing. Uh, and the energy and enthusiasm uh, for the, from the neighbors has been overwhelming. Um, we've, uh, um, now, the only thing that they've said is, we love this. This is exactly what we've been hoping for and dreaming for for this park, uh, but please help us with parking and traffic. So what's the best way to solve parking and traffic? Let's not have people drive to games. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, the partnership with BART uh, and the reliance on public transportation is a big part of our value system. We have said that we want driving to be a last resort, not a first resort to games. But as an example of what happens when you start to activate the wonderful communities of the Bay Area is organically things start building on top of that. So we've been doing community meetings, and at the community meetings, we now had five neighbors volunteer to lead bike caravans from West Oakland BART. We want to partner with uh, um, Bikes East Bay to provide a valet. <laughs> Um, uh, so that it becomes easy, safe, and secure to connect from, from, from West Oakland Bike, which is actually less than a mile away, 0.8 miles. Easy walk. But, um, so we are I incredibly excited about our partnership uh, with BART. Um, we're going to wear BART on our arm. We're powered by BART. Um, and so thankful uh, for the staff for working with us to make that happen um, and really excited to see the partnership continue. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to say anything? Uh, yeah, we're just we're just so happy to be here. Um, you know, if this was just about baseball, it'd be noteworthy and, and, and maybe even praiseworthy and certainly a lot of fun. But um, like Paul said, you know, our commitment is to the community. Our, our commitment is to give the community something to cheer for, to keep that something to cheer for in the community, and and to build with the community and not on the community. And so we're we're just so excited to partner with uh, perhaps the most iconic, uh, you know, brand. In, in the Bay Area that, that kind of unites the whole community. So um, happy to be here with Bart. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I do want to say, and, and I've been a big baller cheerleader. We haven't uh, played one game yet, but I feel like I'm, again, not knowing anything about baseball, I'm sold, partly because the owners have selected just a supreme management team. They have been recruiting players from some of the best minor league teams in the country. Uh, the ballers are going to ball out, and we're going to be one of the winning teams. And I am so excited that we are on the early end um, of this space. Another thing I think it's important to say, especially in a time in the Bay Area of such austerity, um, it should be noted that the ballers' management and owners have put their own private money and money uh, from the private space into this venture, really to make Oakland a better place. And a public-private partnership is suiting to that kind of energy, and BART is so excited to be, again, on the field with you all. With that, one of, we have a special announcement, and one of those announcements will be from the ballers coach and former San Francisco Giants first baseman, J.T. Snow. Let's take a look. Hello, BART writers. This is J.T. Snow, former San Francisco Giants first baseman and current coach of the Bay Area's newest team, the Oakland Ballers. The Ballers are proud to partner with BART for our inaugural season. 
and I'm happy to say today is National Transit Employee Appreciation Day. I'd like to express my gratitude to the outstanding team at BART that keeps the trains running so Bay Area residents like you can get to the events you love. Like all the exciting sporting events we have to enjoy in the Bay Area, the dedicated BART staff also helps you save money on gas, bridge tolls, and parking, and is the best way to get to the game with your friends and fellow fans. So please join me in taking a moment to smile, wave, and say thank you to BART employees when you see them today. Thank you all so much. And Paul and Timothy, we thank you for joining the BART family. And I want to thank our general manager and again, Rod Lee's team for making this happen. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Director Simon. As we start the next um, introduction of special guests, I just want to say go Bears. Also here with us today are graduate students from UC Berkeley who did a pretty amazing thing on Saturday. They did a BART speed run and broke the record for the total time it takes to visit all 50 stations. Not only that, they applied to the Guinness World Record to make it an official category. On Saturday, they followed Guinness's strict requirements of including a witness throughout the trip, photos at every station, and as much video evidence as possible. They even live streamed their journey on YouTube and posted on social media along the way. Their official time was five hours, 47 minutes, and 43 seconds, which was a record. Others have done speed runs of BART and posted their times on social media as well. They did a brilliant job mapping out their trip to find the quickest route, relying on time transfer points to beat the record. The students are part of the Transportation Graduate Students Organizing Committee, TRANSOC, which is a graduate student organization at UC Berkeley composed of students from engineering, planning, public policy, and other related disciplines specializing in transportation. The TRANSOC members who are part of the Saturday's BART World Record event are here. Uh, and so if you'll wave so people know who you are. Uh, Win Winnie Zhuang, who's here, who's co-president. Uh, Melody Sao, who's also a co-president. Amin DaCosta. Paul Liu. Jacob Champlin. Mike Santos. And their camera person, Clarence Wen. So with that, why don't we give you an opportunity to, to share a few words and if you've caught up on your sleep and aren't having, you know, dreams about catching that train, uh, we're eager to hear. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I will say the idea to beat this record originated in the fall when Paul first mentioned his speed run of Vancouver's TransLink system to me. So we're like, hey, why not? Uh, we applied for the Guinness World Record in October and we heard back from them in February. We're like, okay, it's real now. Um, we immediately went into planning mode, looking at BART schedules in order to find the quickest route that would allow us to visit every station with minimal backtracking. We also prioritized time transfers and easy cross-platform movement. Um, one concern for us was, when are we going to the bathroom? <laughs> because it's six hours. Um, so we even looked into which BART stations had bathrooms um, and Amin and Jacob went on a personal site visit to Coliseum <laughs> Station the day before our um, world record attempt to scout these bathrooms out, so we're not playing around. Um, multiple spreadsheets later, we had our date, our time, and our route. Um, we assigned each other roles, uh, gathered water, snacks, battery packs for our phones, and coordinated with other Berkeley students and staff to be witnesses along our route for a witness log. So everything went perfectly to plan. We made all of our connections. We had so much fun exploring the system. And we even finished two minutes faster than what we planned for. So shout out to Bart for being super speeding on a Saturday. Um, <laughs> we also made some friends along the way. So some Bart riders were starting to take notice of our um, time logging and scheduling antics. So every rider we spoke to was really friendly and supportive. And I will say our live stream basically never stopped, even under the, um, the tube, uh, under the bay, and we were like, uh, what if we lose this evidence? We need this for the Guinness World Record. So, uh, great reception under the bay. Um, anyway, this whole adventure could not have been possible without our amazing team and our witnesses. Thank you, Bart, specifically Alicia, for interacting with us throughout the trip. As you may have seen from our live stream, we had quite the reaction, mostly a meme, um, <laughs> when we saw your Twitter post and Instagram story covering this. Um, so thanks for inviting us in today. And now Amin can retire his MTA shirt for <laughs> a BART one. Thank you all so much. Um, you 
are all glowing uh, out of this success. And so I think it will certainly inspire others to try and emulate what you've done. And so thank you all. It's, it's great, to, great to see you here. And Director Saltzman. Just wanted to say congratulations. I went to UC Berkeley too, go Bears. Um, and I would not have guessed when we changed our schedule, which is something I really pushed for to get rid of those 30 minute headways, that it could make a world record possible. So yay, better service, we get a world record. Congratulations. That's outstanding. Any other colleagues? Thank you so very much. Thank you for joining us today. Do we, Alicia, do you want to take a picture with everyone? Okay, so we'll come around and join you. Thank you so much, directors. We'll now go to uh, the report of the board president. And let me start out and say. Um, president uh, Dufty, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. We actually had public comment on the intro oh, item. I'm so sorry. Thank you. So no speaker cards, but we do have a hand on Zoom. We'll go to Alita. Alita, please go ahead. Um, Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, President Bevan Dufty and members. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, uh, my pronouns are she and her, uh, with team folds representing skirt folds. I, I don't think I've ever commented on um, special guests, but this is special. And now my screen went blank. Hope you can hear me. Uh, lo lots of good things. Uh, I wrote a letter a while back about the partnership with sports and how BART can be a means to bring people to uh, sporting events and other uh, events that bring large numbers of people. And I really hope that uh, this baseball season, which is a team that I know nothing about, is really going to be a successful public transportation event. Uh, that, that park is actually located near an AC Transit bus stop. So for those getting off BART, they can use AC Transit or uh, those scooters, and, or it's not a long walk. So uh, we want to work with that because my grandfather told me about the polo grounds uh, in New York City and seeing baseball there, in uh, Ebbets Field in uh, Brooklyn. Uh, and I'm really intrigued, uh, very grateful for this team that did the BART challenge. Uh, so anyway, thank you. Thank you so much, Alita. Now we'll proceed to the report of the board president and it will be exciting and fun. And I, I, it, I would also welcome the general manager to reflect as you really led many of the discussions with our delegation that we met with. So I understand that there are some photos that, that we've got coming up on the screen. And uh, we're working on resetting here and we'll pull up the deck in just a few minutes or so, or if not sooner. Super. All right. Well, let me just go briefly to the board committee reports and, and indicate that there are no reports. The, uh, the committee, the special personnel committee did meet, but there is no report on that. And then um, I will go, I don't know if there's any public comment on that. No, any requests? No? I didn't receive Great. Any so why don't we call out the consent calendar, District, sure. Madam District Secretary? Are there any items that uh, colleagues would like to have separated to be considered separately? Not seeing that, could I enter? I'm sorry, is there a motion? Second. Move approval and seconded. So. I didn't receive any speaker cards and I don't see any hands raised on Great. Zoom. Let's proceed to the vote. Director Allen. Director Ames. 
Vice President Foley? Aye. Director Lee? Yes. Director McPartland? Director Rayburn? Yay. Director Saltzman? Director Simon? Yes. President Dufty? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Great. That is outstanding. Um, and are we still working on? We, we are, President Dufty. I, uh, well, maybe we should just come back and do this. Uh, I was going to say, make a suggestion, just move on, because it's an important item. So Certainly. So, colleagues, we're going to move uh, to closed session. Uh, and so is there any public comment about the upcoming closed session? Yes, thank you. Uh, no speaker cards, but we do have a hand on Zoom. Thank and you. And Alita, I will go ahead and display a clock on Zoom. It will just take me a couple seconds to get there. All right. Alita, please go ahead. Um, th thanks again, uh, President Duffy and members. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her with Team Holt. I don't know why I have a totally black screen here. But anyway, I'm going to talk about closed session. Um, there is a general counsel matter. As I mentioned before, I guess we're getting in the home. Okay, now I have a script. Thank you. Uh, now I guess we're getting in the home stretch of this, and I do claim standing um, because I feel that the general counsel should not just be about legal interpretation and technical expertise, uh, but about people. You know, uh, Matt Burroughs uh, was, was very approachable. Uh, he was your permanent general counsel, and uh, Matt was uh, good at answering my questions, and he always enjoyed seeing me at meetings, and uh, uh, he's gone now. And, and I hope our future, future general counsel will have a, um, that same kind of mindset. Why my clock is frozen at 248, I don't know. Um, we've got to work on this because I don't want to take up too much time. Thank you, um, Lita. There's 148 left. I'm not sure yeah, why it's frozen. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call that in later. Um, but how do we have a, a general counsel and a general counsel team uh, that will know what to do with me, know what to do with people? Uh, because BART is all about people, and we want to make sure that our legal uh, expertise and management it's going to ensure that uh, the people are going to be able to have the safe, reliable, and equitable experience uh, that anyone would expect on this system. So uh, I would hope that whoever you hire as general counsel will be somebody who uh, has a, a familiarity with BART, hopefully somebody who uh, uses BART um, I know plenty of people who work for the New York City subway, and they actually use the subway uh, and the buses uh, and the railroads to get to and from their jobs. Uh, so I think we have to have a deep familiarity with, with BART. Uh, so anyway, and then there's some other things with labor negotiation, which I don't know much about that. I hope that your times in that closed room will not be acrimonious, but I ask this of you when you sit down a day and make your decisions to remember this ideal. I hope you share it with me, that BART is the people's system. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So now, Madam District Secretary, we can move to closed session. Yes, there are no additional hands raised. Is it, is it set up to do now, or let's go to closed session? Yeah. Yeah, yeah.
Good morning. We are resuming our meeting, and I would like to make an announcement. The board has concluded its closed session on items 5.A and 5.B. There is one announcement. The board has appointed Gina Zeeland Peterson as, as general counsel effective March 14th, 2024. The vote on the appointment was unanimous. And I'd like to call on Director Simon. Thank you, <clears throat> President Dufty. Um, we're announcing that the Board of Directors for Bay Area Rapid Transit has approved the following terms of employment for Gina Zellen Peterson, effective March 14th, 2024, which shall be incorporated in a mutually satisfactory written employment agreement for execution for Ms. Zehan. Why is that Zelen? Am I pronouncing this right, Gina? Zelen. Zelen. Let me start that all over. <laughs> The board has approved the following terms of employment for Gina Zellen Peterson, effective March 14th, 2024, which shall be incorporated in a mutually satisfactory written agreement for execution by Ms. Zellen Peterson and the board president, Bevan Dufty. Service for an indefinite term at the pleasure of this board with a base salary of $340,000 per year 12 month severance pay for involuntary termination unless a result of death, gross misconduct, mandatory arbitration of employment disputes, benefits afforded, non representative management, employees and retirees, and upon retirement, option to participate in an alternative retiree medical, dental, and vision plan if Ms. Zelan Peterson relocates to an area which is not within the service area of the district sponsored plan provided the alternative plan is comparable in both cost and coverage to the district sponsored plan. Thank you so President. much. So that's a motion and is there a second? Bowling? Thank you so much. And then we'll go to the vote. Madam District Secretary. Certainly. <laughs> Director Simon. Yes. Director Allen. Director Ames. Yes. Vice President Foley. Aye. Director Lee. Yes. Director McPartland. Aye. Director Rayburn. Yay. Director Saltzman. Yes. President Dufty. Yes. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Congratulations, Gina. Yay. General Counsel, would you like to share a few words? Thank you so much. Thank you um, to the board. I really appreciate this opportunity to serve BART. Um, as you all know, I've been here at BART for 15 years. Um, I love this place. My heart, my heart is in it, um, and I'm so, so excited to be in this role. Um, and I just wanted to mention um, to Alita, um, who spoke earlier on this item, um, I heard you, and I agree with you that it's about people. That's why I wanted this job. Um, I wanted to serve the people of this organization and the people of the Bay Area in a leadership role. Um, so thank you for mentioning that. And I, I also just want to say a couple more thank yous. Oh, I see some of my team members here. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, I want to thank my peers um, who are up here with me um, and some who are not, the board appointed officers and the entire executive management team for your support the last five months during the transition. Um, I really appreciate the support I've gotten from you all and from all BART employees that I've interacted with these last five months. Um, and I want to say a special thank you to my team who are here. What a nice surprise to see your faces in the room. Um, I could not be more proud or fortunate to be working with you. Um, it's a group of really dedicated, smart, hardworking public servants. Um, I'm really excited to work with you in this role. Thank you. <laughs> And certainly we're proud that this is a history-making appointment and we look forward to all that you'll do for the district and we appreciate your belief in the district and that you've given your career to this agency and um, we stand up for you. We thank you. Thank you. Bob, would you like to say something? <laughs> Never at a loss for words, President Dufty. I, I just wanted to just... Um, congratulate uh, Gina Zealand on her appointment here and um, I've had a long history of working very collaboratively very um, uh, 
working through the topics um, from the legal perspective, from the public perspective, and I've enjoyed every minute of it, and I just look forward to, you know, 20 more years, Gina, of you and I working closely together, helping to um, bring public transit, the greatest public transit to the Bay Area. So thank you and congratulations. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So now we'll go back to uh, the, one thing? oh, certainly, Director Simon. I think it's also important to acknowledge that it is Women's History Month, and we have appointed our first woman general counsel to Bay Area Rapid Transit's community, and it's a huge deal. And I, unlike many people in this room, have been on the other side of the table as Miss Gina, and she's the toughest person you'll ever be in your life. Bart is in exquisite hands. Um, and we're just very, very thankful that you've made the decision to tussle it out with us in this process. You were by far uh, just the most stellar candidate and we're very, very, very lucky, uh, pleased, and as my grandmother would say, very blessed, I think, to have you taking on what you've been doing for months as our general counsel work formally. And so I think this, on the behalf of this board, I sure I speak in unison. Um, you know, we got a fighter uh, in this top office. And so thank you so much for taking on this role. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll go now to item two, report of the board president. And I am so pleased to have the opportunity to kick off a report on our visit to Washington, D.C. Six directors went to Capitol Hill and to the Federal Transit Administration and with our general manager and our exceptional team from our government and community relations uh, organization, and that would include um, Rod Lee, who's the assistant general manager, and Amanda Cruz, who is uh, with us in Washington. And then I do want to acknowledge that there were some parts of, of government and community relations who individuals who were working who didn't go to Washington. And I want to thank Alex Walker uh, from the team who worked with Amanda and Rod and did an incredible amount of work putting together our documents and our schedule. And then I'd also like to acknowledge um, Mark Nagales and Neha Balram, and they are also part of uh, GCR who did a fantastic job. Um, I also wanna thank Mickey Morales because she booked our travel and our stay in Washington, and it was a fast-moving and ever-changing challenge on her part. And she is always so good in helping us file our reports and you know, seeking reimbursements and having our hotel rooms work out. And so I just wanna thank Mickey. And on the CJ Lake team that does our representation, uh, we obviously had Lynn Hawkes and Emily Bakke and Curtis Erdman. Um, and behind me have been photos of our meetings. And I think I wanna let Bob speak, our general manager speak at this moment because it was a great reception that we had, um, very positive on the part of our congressional members, congressional staff members who see how hard this agency is working to bring back riders through Safe and Clean and, and, and other initiatives. And so, Bob, would you like to share a few words? Yes, I would. Thank you, President Dufty. And first, let me just associate myself with your comments earlier on, on the thankings. Um, very thoughtful, and um, I wanted to just augment a little bit on, you know, Amanda Cruz and, you know, the six directors, I wanted to thank you for being out there, and we're going to these meetings, but the meetings are moving around, right? They're moving location, they're moving, you know, who's attending the meetings, they're moving, you know, what to strategize on, what to focus on, you know, and I'm there, Rod's there, we're there, um, but it's Amanda and, and Emily in the background navigating this, and I just wanted to thank both Amanda Cruz from the BART family and Emily from the extended BART family on, um, the dynamic run of show that we um, that we walk through all day Tuesday and Wednesday. So let me just start there. Then I wanted to just say a few words, uh, President Dufty. I too thought those meetings. I, we had meetings all day Tuesday, um, and pretty much most of the day Wednesday. Look, I thought the the meetings were very constructive. I really did. I thought they were very strategic. 
And I thought that BART going back to Washington, D.C. on a cadence, we had just been there one about five months ago, Rod, and that, that cadence, they remember, I'm telling you, because I, I was at the, you know, the original set, us coming back in that four, fun, four or five month time period really amplified um, you know, the topics that we were discussing with our federal delegation. And um, I, I just want to remind the board and, and the BART family here, we got to get on that cadence again because it did resonate with the elected officials that, oh, we, you were here four months ago and we were talking about, you know, progressive policing and, you know, and they knew what we were talking about. And um, I really did think the meetings were very strategic and constructive and wanted to thank all of you uh, for your leadership in those meetings. I know I said a lot in those meetings, but you chimed in and, and took point as the elected officials and um, um, were very thoughtful there. So um, I look forward to the next, you know, in four or five months going back. Um, I say, to the folks in the, at this meeting here and the folks watching in public, there were a couple of themes that we always touched on, right? One certainly was our fiscal cliff. We kind of led with our fiscal cliff. One way or the other, we kind of led with our fiscal cliff. Um, and the discussions going on both in Sacramento right now and with this BART board. We led with, you know, the last 30 months or 24 months, the eight or 10 decisions that we have made jointly, whether it's service, the safe and clean plan, the progressive policing, the presence in the system. Um, it, it really are, those decisions are coming into line. And then probably the third theme, we framed up fares. And it wasn't just about the fare gate program and where we are with that. That certainly was the element and element of that discussion. But also the means-based fare program um, and our fair integration work in our Bay Pass was um, a very hot topic there and where we're going with that program, you know, complementing the, the new fair gates that we have going there. So I just, um, I came away from that set of meetings feeling very good about where we have been and the direction that we're going in right now. And I wanted to just thank this board for their leadership for that. Thank you, and I'd like to go, uh, starting on my right, with the directors who uh, were with us in Washington, Director Ames. Thank you, President Dufty. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Bob. I mean, you really summed it up, uh, the, the relationship building, the information sharing, and I'm going to miss my colleagues here because many of you aren't going to be here um, come November, and uh, it's good to just hand the baton to the members that are here, like myself, that'll be here for the next few years trying to push for this new regional measure, which a lot of them uh, were interested in finding out about. And, you know, I wasn't there asking for money per se, but basically it was just relationship building, building and sharing information. And, you know, we, you know, just to just kind of briefly go over the schedule, which is intense, I just want to elaborate, this was a lot of work that staff did, thank you. Um, you know, from going to um, the Office of uh, uh, Representative Ro Khanna, and then this is in my area, but Representative <coughs> Eric Swalwell, and then Representative Mark Desaunier, and then the next day we were, you know, I was over there, um, Representative uh, John Giramendi. Uh, there, oh, I think there's a picture right there. Um, so I just want to thank everybody to just express my gratitude and the dedication of the staff. We are in a uncertain time. And I hoped that we can convey that, you know, transit is essential among all the other priorities. And I think they get it, thanks to your leadership. Thank you. Director Salzman. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add except to say I think it was a really effective trip. And I, I agree with Bob that going back so soon was really helpful because it felt like we were giving them an update and they actually remembered what we told them last time and a lot of what we told them really stuck with them, which is impressive because they are in a lot of meetings. So I think what we're doing in DC is working and we'll, we're just gonna have to stay in communication during the time that we're not there because they're all very interested in the regional measure. Director McPartland. Thank you. Uh, I would have to say that in years past, uh, uh, we've been in a position where uh, staff really wasn't um, aware of what was going on from a transportation standpoint. And um, 
Uh, and I agree with Bob that uh, the rapid return of us going back there and reinforcing the things that we were discussing uh, was instrumental in having every person that we talked to was on point, knew the history, uh, knew what the ask was, and was encouraged by what we ended up identifying of what we were doing uh, to so help ourselves. And in one particular meeting, we were talking about uh, requests that we had previously put in for grants. And the guy goes on his iPad, oh yeah, you got that one right here. <laughs> uh, that day, 15 minutes before that. So uh, uh, it was refreshing from the start to the finish. It was a little bit colder than I would have liked. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to have spent time with staff and board. Um, and again, what my colleagues have said is, is, is absolutely true. But I think it's important to say that the stories that we were telling about BART, why our QPR was so great in many ways, it's the story of what the employees have done in the system, the folks who are making sure the cars look amazing as soon as they come out of the yards, from our new uh, police recruits who have gone through academy and who are dedicating their time and space uh, away from their families to make our system safe, our wonderful chief, our ambassadors, our oversight, which is so important uh, to keeping the community's trust around law enforcement. And we, we just talked about the work that the 4,000 people here do at BART, and there was so much excitement from our TOD projects that they're that there, many of them are getting shovel ready, that we're housing folks, that we're thinking about the, not only the economy here coming back to fruition, but also the globe. Uh, and we are pushing forward uh, to create and maintain a world-class system. And again, I think us going there telling uh, the stories, evangelizing the good work that folks um, are doing every single day is just such a joy and we should do it more. Um, Every single person that we met with, I think, could collectively say that BART is absolutely on the right track. It was exciting and uh, really great to be able to share the good news of what you all are doing. Thanks so much. Thank you. Director Rayburn? Well, I should start by just thanking Amanda Cruz and Rod Lee for their tremendous work along with our advocates in Washington, D.C., who not only negotiate with uh, many of the electeds on a regular basis, but they also uh, served as the logistical navigators for getting us from one place to another to even handling where Mr. Rayburn's luggage would go so that I could leave the Capitol. The highlight for me was a comment made by Nancy Pelosi. And she said that she was reminded by the Secretary of Transportation, Norm Mineta, that transit success is based on regional cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, just once again, thank you to the staff. It was really a, an incredible uh, two and a half days, very productive, and uh, I, we just had, I think, a really productive time. So thank you so much for that. I believe we have a public comment speaker. Yes, we do. Thank you. No speaker cards, but we have a hand on Zoom. Alita? Alita, please go ahead. Um, thanks again, uh, President Bevan, Duff, team members. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her with Team Pulse. Yes, I have my clock here. Thank you. Uh, yeah, good trip. Uh, I like going to Washington, too. I went last year for five days. Uh, hope you all got to ride some public transportation when you were there and took the metro from Dulles Airport, uh, which I have done. And um, I saw you were on some kind of a subway, but it didn't look like a Washington metro subway. Uh, so uh, I hope that in your conversations you were able to it sounded like you got out some things about equity issues. And, uh, I hope you uh, supported the idea of reduced fares. Uh, I certainly, if I was in Washington, I would mention uh, reduced fares. And uh, uh, I would hope to find out offline about how you did your trip and where you stayed. And uh, I don't know what kind of flights you took. Uh, I fly uh, economy or uh, I don't know if you got the lie flat seats or the, anything like that or the 
what kind of hotel you're in. I know lots of good hotels in DC. Uh, so certainly I might uh, inquire of that offline. Uh, but uh, there's a lot I don't understand about uh, doing these trips. I mean, they're important. I support this. And uh, I, I hope you got to do some other things, uh, like maybe go see some museums or take in the natural features, uh, uh, like I do when I'm in uh, Washington. Uh, but it looks like you brought a lot of things up. I mean, we do need to have federal help in keeping our system uh, going, just as we have. And it, this is a challenging time. Uh, so it, I, it sounded like you enjoyed your trip. Hopefully I'll get to meet with you all offline, and find out what your menus uh, were like. Uh, I know lots of good places to eat in Washington. And maybe I'll try staying in one of the hotels that you did and experience that. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Any additional comments? There are no additional hands raised. Thank you so much. So we'll conclude this item and we'll move right into the general manager's report. Thank you, President Dufty. A couple of updates from the general manager here. So you heard earlier from JT Snow, um, the new head coach of the Ballers, um, that Monday, March 18th is gonna be National Transit Employee Appreciation Day. And we're gonna celebrate that day with our employees with, with special posters in our stations, social media posts and overhead announcements, encouraging um, riders to thank our workers, uh, our frontline workers. Um, we'll have announcements throughout the system. You heard one from JT Snow. We're gonna have one from Sherry Young and she is with the African American Shakespeare Company. And then um, I believe I'll have one out there as well. So um, definitely be in the appreciation uh, celebration effort on Monday, March 18th. Uh, many of the directors up here I know firsthand um, are tracking on this, but let me just run an, uh, a few words by you, a concept by you called the final run of the first fleet. And riding into history is what we're calling it, final run of the first fleet. It's the retirement ceremony and uh, the last train ride of our legacy fleet. And it's going to be held on April 20th It'll be at 1 p.m. and it'll be at MacArthur Station. Um, it'll be a big public event um, and I'm tracking on it very closely and I know I've been um, had uh, healthy discussions with many of you at the board making sure we have our act together there. But um, I point you in that direction and, and encourage you to get it on your calendar for April 20th at one o'clock. Uh, track shutdown, this is our second week of the shutdown for uh, the R line, and this again, this is the second week. It's between Richmond and El Cerrito del Norte stations. Um, we're going to replace a turnout there. We'll do some station work at Richmond and continue with our tree removal. Obviously, we're in coordination with AC Transit on uh, a bus bridge there, so I think we're in pretty good shape there. So next week, um, we will be participating in the National Society of Black Engineers. It's called NSBE. Um, and it will be um, in Atlanta, Georgia, and it'll be approximately 10,000 students that attend this event. And we will be setting up a booth there on a recruitment um, effort uh, led by um, Sylvia Lamb and our infrastructure delivery program. Um, and this is all about um, promoting and providing professional service and, professional, and personal development opportunities uh, for folks. And so we'll be out there in full force at the Nesby event um, next week. Um, Bach in the Subway. Once again, we are uh, participating in the international Bach in the Subway celebration where we invite local musicians to perform Bach in the free areas of our stations. Um, the last 10 days of March, so the 21st through the 31st, um, and we'll certainly be promoting that on social media. Uh, ridership uh, for the month of February came in right about at budget expectations, plus or minus 1%, um, so we're tracking pretty closely there. Weekend ridership in February was boosted uh, by Saturday, the February 24th, with a pretty good ridership of 124,000 exits. The Chinese New Year's Parade and other events uh, helped with that Saturday. And then um, 
You know, we're trending right now a little bit below our budget of 170,000 um, weekday riders. We're at about 164, but the recent weather has been a little rough on us, but you know, we expect that to go back up. Um, so with that, President Dufty, Vice President Foley, I'll, I'll take any questions from the board. I don't see any requests. So, so um, any public comment speakers? Yes. Yes. Thank you. No speaker cards, but we do have a hand on Zoom. So we'll go to Alita. Alita, please go ahead. Um, th thanks again, uh, President Bevan Dufty and members. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her with Team Holtz. Uh, very good report as always. I, I always like Bob's very meaningful and credible reports, they're, and they're very easy to understand. Um, so uh, I, I have heard about uh, the final trip on the Legacy Fleet. Uh, a similar event was, I believe, was done in New York when the R-32s were retired after uh, about 55 years of service. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll get there. Uh, hopefully we can have some music. Uh, I would like to hear some Jerry Rafferty's Right Down the Line or uh, Last Train to London by Jeff Lynn and maybe some other things. Uh, don't know much about this trucking song by the Grateful Dead. That might work. So, so we should have some entertainment with that and I'll get to enjoy uh, these new, the, the old trains uh, uh, being uh, retired, but we want to remember them. I hope we can preserve them. Uh, I, I mean, yes, they had their issues, but uh, we, we want to be mindful of tradition and history, so we don't want to forget about the old trains. Uh, so uh, ridership, I mean, it's coming up. We're managing. We want to continue to work uh, toward more ridership. I have been on the trains when I have been in Oakland and using them. And I'm intrigued about this National Black Engineer uh, Association group, which will go down to Atlanta and uh, share the word about uh, the things of art. We need the very best uh, talent that we can get at art. And I'm sure that some of that talent will be at that uh, event. And hopefully we can bring some people from that event and uh, uh, bring them to work for BART and to help build uh, BART uh, into our future. So I look forward to your report on that and, and the type of flight shoes, and, uh, recreation and food and hotels, things like that. I want to know about that. And uh, how, how do we uh, get uh, to our next level? I think this report is certainly uh, saying that. And uh, the mention uh, about the baseball, uh, certainly it's worth... Uh, investigating. I have not been to a live baseball game since 1976. Went to two of them in New York City, both in stations, in stadiums that no longer exist. Uh, hopefully they'll have food at this um, place. And, and hopefully we can get people onto BART, as I've said before. Um, back, back in the days of my forebears, people took the subway to, to see baseball. They had what's called a subway series, believe it or not. That's real. Uh, that actually happened. So, so I appreciate the report because it continues to espouse the idea of BART being the people system. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't believe there are any other speakers, and so we'll conclude this item, and we'll now move to the Planning, Public Affairs, Access, and Legislation Committee, and Director Rayburn will lead us on the next two important items. Thank you, President Dufty. Uh, the Planning and Public Affairs Access and Legislation Committee is now in session, and we're going to consider two information items, but they're both very weighty. Uh, BART Transit Oriented Development Program's work plan, along with a review uh, and an update of the 2024 Bay Area Regional Housing Bond. So we have first Val and is able staff ready to share all the hard work that you've done. Great, thank you, Director Rayburn. Again, this is an information item and we have Carly Payne, our group manager of transit oriented development and she's joined by Kamala Parks, who is a principal planner. Uh, Carly. Good 
almost afternoon directors, Carly Payne. Um, we're here to provide you information about the 2024 transit-oriented development work plan update and answer any questions you have and take your input. Okay, so BART's transit-oriented work, uh, development work plan outlines our priorities for the next five to ten years and identifies the work needed by BART and our partner jurisdictions to get sites ready for TOD development. As background, um, we update this work plan about every four years. The last time we brought it to you was in 2020. Um, there have been many changes since 2020. Um, and in particular that have influenced this update, an increased demand and interest in um, residential development, um, a decreased demand in office development, and increasing construction costs both um, on the labor side and materials side. Um, uh, something's happening funny with the screen, so I'm gonna Pause. Okay, I'm going to assume that they'll take care of it and keep going. I, I think we can. Great. So we've also, since we last came to you with this work plan, completed phases at four of our transit-oriented development sites. We're actively advancing <laughs> development at five um, stations on TODs. Um, and we've been working with lo local jurisdictions this past year to get 22 um, of our developable sites to be uh, n nominated, and now they've been accepted as um, eligible for regional funding that's existing and in the future through MTC and BAFA's Priority Sites Program. This is a snapshot of our TOD portfolio. We have, um, that shows, you know, what we've built, what's in active uh, planning, um, we have TODs at 15 of our BART stations. We have eight sites that are in active planning with developers on board. I do want to call out that um, our active sites have a higher percentage of affordable housing on them than what's already been built. So we are moving, you know, in the direction that this board has asked us to. The board had set um, targets for the TOD program a 2040 goals for 20,000 residential units and 4.5 million commercial with a 35% affordability at the portfolio level and then some 2025 targets which we're on our way to meeting but we're not quite there and I would say while we've made a lot of progress towards our midterm goal, we're not gonna get there in 2025. Primarily I would say issues around costs, cost of money, cost of construction, and the availability of sufficient funding, um, in particular uh, availability of affordable housing funding, have kept projects from advancing more quickly. To update our work plan, um, we've worked closely with the local cities and counties where our developable land um, lies. We did a survey to staff at jurisdictions, held follow-up meetings with them. We've coordinated also with regional agencies, MTC and BAFA, on making sure that we're aligning policies as we're moving forward. And we did a quantitative scoring process, generally using the same evaluation criteria as in the 2020 work plan update. We added a new um, criteria, which is development capacity both in light of us not quite getting to our targets and really to make sure that we are being efficient with our resources and delivering as much development as possible, we added in development capacity, which had been considered in a more qualitative way um, previously. We've continued to meet with jurisdictions, including in advance of this meeting, and, and made sure to send the draft to jurisdictions. I'm gonna turn it over to my esteemed colleague Kamala to share the results. Thank you, Carly. Our coordination with the cities and counties last year for the TOD work plan update found that local interest in advancing TOD at BART stations, which was already strong in 2020, has grown. And this is because the housing crisis is continuing and constituents are shifting their attitudes as well as state enforcement of the 
2023 through 2031 housing element. As demonstrated in the chart on the right, local agency staff want to be begin formal pre-solicitation efforts, which is about a two-year collaborative process immediately at half of the 22 BART, stations, BART sites that cities identified at the TOD for the next 10 years. Staff from a few jurisdictions did want to wait for the commercial real estate market to rebound. It's important to note that BART staff engages local, in local plan, initiated planning efforts even before formal pre-solicitation begins. For example, BART is an identified stakeholder by the cities of Arinda, San Leandro, and Lafayette for their PDA and parking management efforts. In addition, BART staff monitors planning activities that are adjacent to its stations, such as we are doing at the North Concord station with regard to the community reuse project. These kinds of efforts are critical for making BART sites ready for development. After evaluating the 22 sites that jurisdictions selected for market conditions and looking at their local agency responses to the TOD work plan update, BART staff identified three timeframes for advancing sites to developer solicitation. <coughs> the first two are near term, uh, five, these are five-year time periods, near-term 2024 through 2028, mid-term 2029 through 2033, and long-term, which is 2034. As you can see below, there are five sites in the near-term, eight sites in the mid-term, and nine, so nine sites in the long-term. They are shown in, in alphabetical order, not in order of priority. And this is our, it represents our ability to collaborate with the local agencies in formal pre-solicitation efforts. Just as a reminder that in addition to these new solicitation efforts, BART staff must continue to engage in extensive pre-development efforts for the eight sites that are currently in the pipeline. And as Carly mentioned, we do update this plan every four, five, four years because of the dynamic nature of development. In addition to the A line, in addition to these efforts, we are working on a parallel effort for the A line jobs attraction study focused on BART sites from Fruitvale to Warm Springs, South Fremont, that are strongest for locating employment uses at the densities that will increase BART ridership. This will be issued as a draft by the end of this year. Now back to Carly. We are here to hear your feedback. Um, the full work plan document is online. Um, we intend to finalize it and publish it in the next few months. We're really excited that we've been uh, collaborating with MTC to put a webinar on for local jurisdictional staff to really work through um, what it means to partner with BART on TOD. It is very different than taking in a private development. We really see our jurisdictional partners as partners. Um, and of course, we're going to continue advancing the existing deals. We expect to bring um, uh, the El Cerrito Plaza forward in hopefully April um, to the board. And we are looking forward to issuing a developer solicitation documents for Ashby later this year. So with that, um, Happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you very much for your thorough presentations, Carly and Kamala. Uh, we're experiencing a bit of a technical difficulty, but I don't think it's more than uh, a bit of a disruption to the presentation. Before we take questions, uh, I want to ask if we have anybody online or in the audience that would like to make a public comment. No, we do not, or Chair Rayburn, thank you. Let's turn to the directors. I oh. see Director Simon. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a quick question, and again, it's uh, something we can also follow up on, and I appreciate in your presentation, you lifted up the fact that uh, receiving resources from the state and the feds to support uh, low-income housing and moderate rate housing in some of these projects has been difficult. If, if 
you know, we just came back from DC and we knew that clearly this is an issue to, to push some of these projects forward, especially in my district. Um, will you talk a little bit about um, the fact that we're there? Uh, how, how long uh, do you feel like we're gonna have to, to push and wait, um, wait and push and vice versa, and to either receive those funds um, and, or is, is this a trend that we're gonna just have to contend with um, moving forward? I would say, thank you for the question. You know, many of our development partners who are doing affordable housing are really looking to the state for funding. I would say, you know, there's federal tax credits, which is a part of it, but you have to have a whole stack of funding. Um, and while the state has made more funding available over the past however many years, it is incredibly oversubscribed. And I'm, as you may know, the next item on the agenda is Kate Hartley from um, BAFA, and she'll be talking about an initiative at the regional level to try and address um, some of that demand here within our zone of influence um, to try and bring more resources to bear. Um, you know, some of the state programs are something like 25 times oversubscribed. And so we can have really great projects that, you know, need that last layer of funding, but if, you know, they don't get it, they are waiting another year to try and compete again. Um, and so, you know, everything could align and projects can put their money together and it can go quickly or, through no fault of the project's own, it can take longer. I appreciate, you know, with West Oakland and even in the process of South Berkeley, uh, while these processes are continuing to push forward, South Berkeley is very different than West Oakland, but your team and Rod's team have worked really hard to activate those spaces in, in the midst of, of, of really trying to build very, very complicated packages to get this stuff rolling. So I appreciate that and thank you for the explanation around funding. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Before I turn to Director Lee, I heard that we have Mayor Coleman from San Fran South San Francisco who would like to speak on the item. Yes. Please go ahead. You have three minutes. Thank you, Chair Rayburn. Mayor Coleman, please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for, for allowing me to give public comment. Um, my name is James You're Coleman. Welcome. I'm currently serving as the mayor of South San Francisco. Um, first, you know, I'd like to thank you so much for your work on this TOD work plan. We are in dire need of housing, of all income levels, of affordable housing. And I'm very happy to see that BART is playing a very engaged role in making this happen. Uh, I saw in the work plan update, however, that South San Francisco is currently placed in the long-term bucket. However, I would really like to urge the BART board to prioritize South San Francisco. There's a lot of uh, good infill and opportunities for affordable housing on and around our local BART station here. Uh, and we also have many good amenities like several markets, schools, parks that are around that BART station. And it'd really be a missed opportunity to not look at South San Francisco for uh, your TOD work plan in near or midterm. And so uh, that's you know basically what I'd like to ask for. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity here. We do have a very uh, pro-housing and forward-thinking council, and it really, in order to meet our reading members for an upcoming cycle, uh, we definitely would like to uh, take advantage of the, the land on and around our local bar station. Um, and that's all. Thank you so much for, for uh, listening to my comment. Thank you for your comment. Do we have any other public speakers? No, we do not, Chair Rayburn. Could I ask staff if South San Francisco was in your survey of jurisdictions? Yes, it was. And so they were able to share what resources they can bring to the table? And they were, um, I would say that being in the longer term does not mean that it's not a great site. As Kamala mentioned, the level of interest in moving forward with BART TOD in the coming, you know, the near term way over um, what, what was oversubscribed compared to what we can legitimately move forward. Um, 
And I would also say that we do update our work plan every four years, and so things can advance. Um, we've identified within the work plan actions for jurisdictions to do to help make a site ready, and um, so we're looking forward to seeing many more sites be ready. Thanks. If we had the staff bandwidth, I'm sure we could process a lot more projects. I think it's... Staff is, the bandwidth is, is just one element, uh, Director Rayburn, there's other elements. It's, it's, that's not the meter on, it's a meter, it's not the meter on, on um, the volume that, of work that you can put out. But it, it's, I, I knew it, at some point we'd get that question, and I'm just, just helping you a little bit here, Carly. It's a element, it's not the answer to the, to the challenge, uh, Director Rayburn. Thank you Director. for that clarification. Director, if I could just join you in briefly on this topic, I just Go would right like ahead. to say that I think that um, the interest of, of uh, the mayor and uh, the interest of uh, Senator Josh Becker, um, we're gonna be engaged and uh, be connected. And I think when there's focus, it, there are opportunities. So I do wanna say that we are very aware and we look forward to having um, dialogue and being engaged and getting certainly having South San Francisco put the best foot forward and to, to the extent that they can help us understand things that we might not previously have been aware of I, I think there's lots of opportunity here so I, I, I really appreciate you asking the questions so that listeners uh, and, the, and the mayor know that we are very interested and uh, certainly director Lee has along with myself really endeavored to be accessible to San Mateo, and so we'll continue that. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. Thanks for that elaboration. Uh, Director Lee, followed by Director Ames. Um, I don't think anyone at BART staff could have imagined when AB 293 was under consideration that we'd have mayors of local jurisdictions calling in being like, hello, where's my housing? So look how far we have advanced, and thank you so much, Mayor James Coleman, for calling in today. Um, so, this is a little bit of a technical conversation, in, or I have some questions that I think will probably be better answered in part by the next presentation we're gonna have. I'm glad that Kate Harley is able to join. Um, but my understanding is that certain jurisdictions are behind on meeting their arena goals, and so they're urgently trying to meet their commitments by pushing for higher density rate around BART, right? Like just because of AB 2923 and because TOD is maybe the most palatable way to densify, you know, certain jurisdictions that are less housing dense. I mean, I, I do wish that those such jurisdictions would embrace more housing and increased housing affordability in general across their cities. Um, but with that said, I think the scramble to meet RENA goals is certainly helping boost our BART TOD program. I'm sure it's encouraging folks to actually say yes when you reach out and they're like, oh yes, this is a way that we can ensure that we continue getting our state money. Given this, I am very glad to hear and see in the presentation that um, the 22 sites that are part of the MTC priority de area designation, I think that'll be really helpful. I, is, that, is that going to be used for the housing bond allocations as well, potentially? I think that'll be a good question for Kate, but my understanding is that when the nomination period was happening, it was um, to be eligible for existing funding to do some pre-development planning or support development that was kind of shovel ready and to become eligible for potential future monies, which I believe include the regional measure. Got it. So, I mean, I think MTC priority area designation is one tool but are there other unique tools or ways that we can bring in additional dollars specifically at BART, given that local jurisdictions are like really trying to get these BART TOD sites to be shovel ready, to be ready to go, to be parceled out, to like get into entitlement processes, et cetera. So, I, I mean, for me, one is like, have we been part of the conversations around the, re and if you're just like, I'll answer this next, or like Janice, like wait until the next presentation, that's fine. but. Um, with a regional housing bond, I know that there's a regional pot and then each county has to determine how they spend those dollars. Like, has BART been part of those conversations for some of these stations that might be closer to being shovel ready? Like, are we at the table saying like, 
hey, whatever county, like Alameda County, this site is really ready to go. Like, can we ensure that this is part of the budget prioritization for when housing bond dollars, like down the line, come in? Um, I think there, you know, I'm really looking at that at sort of the county and regional level. And then at the state level, obviously there's TCAC, there was that one time California Housing Accelerator Funds. Um, and I'm sure as housing production and affordability remain a top priority for the state, th there will inevitably be different types of programs and dollars sort of coming in in all different ways. You know, what are ways that, what are we all doing and what are ways that BART can ensure that there is budget prioritization for those funding programs? First on the regional, uh, the bond measure funding. Um, Part of what I see my role to do is to make sure that the counties where we have developable sites, um, that they know that we are very eager to be on their expenditure list. Most of the county, the counties aren't working on these yet, um, and Kate can talk to you about the timeline. Um, and similarly with BAFA to help uh, um, educate about our TOD program and what great sites we have so that we are top of mind. So that's the first. On state funding, um, the way that we work with our, transit, our TOD development partners is um, we really do see it as a partnership and so we are often partnering on grants with them either in, in different grant programs at different levels of government have um, who the applicant can be is different. So sometimes it's us, sometimes it's the developer, sometimes it's a local jurisdiction. So we're really trying to be strategic to position ourselves and our projects and the BART and other transportation infrastructure that go along with the TODs so that we can really bring in as much as possible. That also involves you know, conversations within BART about other priorities that might be competing for those funds. And so it's, it's, it is a um, joint effort in that way. Yeah, I, like I, I know that you are all doing a lot of work to boost BART. I, I'm almost feeling like, is there a policy or is there a systemic way that we can really prioritize these sites given sort of mutual needs, right? In local jurisdictions needing to meet their arena goals, wanting to develop. And so I don't know, maybe this is a, something for a ROD's team to sort of note in the future as we think about future legislation. Like, are there ways that we can work with our state legislators that specifically in the Bay Area, you get additional points on grant applications when it's BART or w whatever it is. I mean, I, I, again, I, whatever ways that we can bring in more dollars to actually build affordable housing at our sites and be able to get other transit benefits like that is so win-win across the board. But um, thank you for this presentation. I don't have any other comments or questions. Thank you, Director Lee. I think I have Director Salzman in the list. I'm having some technical difficulties seeing the speaker list on my screen. So yes. you can just flag me if I don't, okay. don't recognize you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank staff for the tremendous effort of this. I mean, I know the first work plan was a lot of work. Um, that was a very good work plan, but this clearly took even more data and more conversations to have. Um, and I think the results are great. I mean, they would be better if the economy was better, but we only have so much impact on that. Um, so there's some limitations, and I think it's important to consider those limitations and be, be realistic. Um, I think it's great that the only city we heard from today is saying push us forward faster, and I think we're going to hear that probably from more cities as this gets out there more. So um, I wanted to know more about the plan to get this out there more, and is there going to be further back and forth? Could this potentially be amended? What, what is the process from here? We are not conceiving of amending it in any kind of significant way. We've as you said, done a lot of evaluation and considered a lot of data. Um, we uh, have notified all of the jurisdictions of this meeting and the work plan being up on the website. 
offered to meet. We've had meetings with some jurisdictions in advance of today. Continue to ha be happy to have further conversations with jurisdictions who still want to meet with us and um, discuss. There are, as Kamala mentioned in one of her slides, we are happy to be partners on planning efforts that get sites ready so that um, when we update the plan next time or should a site not be moving when, that we thought would be moving, that there are other sites that are ready. Um, and as I mentioned, we are doing this uh, webinar in partnership with MTC to really continue the conversation with local jurisdictions about what it takes, what it takes to be ready, how we can partner, because um, it's not just a, okay, we're gonna engage with you four years and then we'll see you in four years if you're not one of our sites. That's, that's not our intention or vision. That's great. Um, when you say you've talked to our jurisdictions, I assume you mean staff? Staff, yes. And so, and this might be more of a question for Rod and his team, what are we gonna do to ensure that the elected officials are aware because my guess is most have not seen this. Some will probably be disappointed with where their cities move backwards. I think for all the cities that move forward, they're gonna say, great, we're not gonna have an issue. But what is that process gonna look like, whether it's through your team or Rod's team, to make sure we don't have to be the ones that deliver it or all of a sudden it comes up in a presentation and they're surprised? Fair question and good question. Um, we have not yet, but will and now I think Rob connect looks like with Rod's to get team. Up, so. Great. <laughs> Good afternoon, Directors Rod Lee, Assistant General Manager, External Affairs. Director Salzman, absolutely, the local government community relations team will work very closely with Val's team, making certain that we push this information out proactively to all the jurisdictions so that they're aware. Okay, and then maybe if you can let them know, like if they want to have meetings about it, we can, and I'm sure many of us directors would be happy to participate. For the, I don't think it'll be a lot of people, but there'll probably be a few who want to have follow-up conversations, so I think it'd be good to just keep us all aware of what those conversations are. Um, these cities are our partners. We've been talking a lot to staff, but I just want to make sure that all their electeds know what's happening, too. Um, and then... I believe it was in here, but I, I read this all on Sunday when I was on a plane. But I think there was like a reference to ridership in this report that took January numbers, and that seemed like the worst number. And if, when this is the, as this becomes final, that just doesn't seem like a great month to memorialize in any report. Um, you know, our December, January typically are down weather and all that. So anyway, if you want to include the whole year or whatever, it just they, they skewed way off with what our reality is, so I don't know. It's a small thing, but it'd be great to update that to something else. That's all I have. Thank you for the work on this. Thank you, and thanks for reminding us that December isn't reflective of the rest of the year. Director Ames. Thank you. I do appreciate you working with all the agencies and the staff. I know you did this before, and I know some cities like Fremont was a little disappointed. It was a little out further out in the timeline. But I, I, I do see that you're trying to align projects, infrastructure work with other needs, um, housing needs and whatever the cities want. So it is a tricky process. So I appreciate the level of effort here. And I wanted to briefly just understand like South Hayward wanted a grocery store forever. It's been, hasn't moved. I think they've wanted a store at, this, at the lot for, I don't know, at least 15 years or so. So how do you um, address like adding like a store into like a housing um, concept? I've seen this at um, Milpita Station. They had a Trader Joe's down below and then they had the housing above, but that all depends on a developer. So maybe you could just walk through like a site that's not moving like South Hayward. Sure. What I think would happen in this case, or in a case like that, is when we go out for a developer solicitation, we would indicate that there's an interest in a ground floor use that is a grocery store. Um, developers who respond would likely do their own market analysis to see is there demand, they would probably do some preliminary conversations with likely grocery stores to see, does this meet their market needs? And if we got responses that seem that 
demonstrated that yes, there genuinely is demand, not just, which, I, and I would say market demand, not as a separate thing from a community interest. And there are um, grocery store tenants that are willing and interested in being part of a development, then we would take that in and you know potentially move forward. It could be that while there is community interest, there is not market demand and not grocery store interest, in which case we would not have proposals that move that forward and we would, you know, probably still move forward with a TOD there. Thank you. I just want to see, I understand the, the difficulty here. If there's no market forces there, something can't happen. Um, but I, I guess the problem I see is that my stations are mainly, um, they're not transit villages. It's, it's usually housing and a little bit of retail. And I'm hoping to revitalize the stations to be more robust, where you, kind of like Millbrae. I love Millbrae. I think it's a great station. It's got everything. Office, you know, it's got VA, VA housing. Um, and I wish that we could get this kind of master developer similar to Millbrae interested in, say, Warm Springs or along all of our stations, frankly, because we don't want to just see housing around the stations with limited retail options. I, just, I was hoping to see more robust land use and um, so with that, I just wanted to do a shout out on the, on the A-Line job study. I appreciate you working on that. I know it's a difficult time. We may look at this as an opportunity for jobs, but it's a different market. And uh, right now, jobs are leaving San Francisco and hopefully they go along the A-Line or the C-Line, wherever, you know, spread out throughout the system to reduce the commute times to get to work. This is why I was hoping to see this flourish at some point. Um, and then on to um, the housing metrics. Uh, I, I do like what El Cerrito, I believe it was, the mayor of El Cerrito came here a while ago and talked about building like missing middle housing, workforce housing. I think it was 80% of the area median income. And I do want to see this kind of blend because when I look at Warm Springs, it's all of this, you know, million dollar condos and frankly, what happens, the unintended consequence of all of this housing is most of it is market rate. And then the rents go up in the surrounding area. And it's just like this unintended consequence of rising rents because now we've got million dollar properties um, for the most part. 80, say 80% 80 of the area around the BART station is market rate. And then it just jacks everything up. And I've I tried to talk to housing and community development about this. I mean, you can't fix all these things, problems, but I would like to see us blending our station on the types of housing and incomes so that that impact isn't so tremendous. The, the market rate housing is just, it's a huge problem in the Bay Area and I, I don't know how to tackle it other than trying to come up with a blended housing income mix. So maybe that segues into your next topic, but thank you so much for all of your work. I appreciate you, thank you. Thank you, Director Ames. Director Foley. Thank you, Chair Rayburn. Um, I had a couple of questions on slide seven, if you could pull that up. That's the time frame to advance the developer solicitations. Um, it looks like we're going from potentially supporting five projects to eight projects um, from the near term to the midterm. So, Kind of piggybacking on an earlier question about staffing, do we have existing staffing that can support doing the five near term? I have some vacancies that I am filling right now and when they're filled then I believe we will. And do we envision that that level of staffing is sufficient to then handle eight projects for the it, midterm? It will be, so we will not be taking down the near-term projects all at once. Understood. We will do them, so, but over the five years, yes. Right. Yes. I just wanted to make sure yeah. the workload made sense with yes. five versus eight over the same four-year window. Right. So, or five-year window. Okay. A um, couple of questions specifically on that slide. Uh, the North Concord Station. So, is that a timeline 
reflective of the draft term sheet that Brookfield has presented to the city of Concord. In other words, their projected phase three work around North Concord. Is this sort of sequentially in line with that window of time? I, so I would just note, uh, uh, Kamala spoke to a slide before that showed kind of planning processes. Yeah. So we know we're gonna need to be engaged at a staff level planning. When we get to the RFQ, RFP phase, you know, in conversations with the city, they thought that was about the right timing for the BART property. Okay, super, that, that, that's good to know. Um, and my last question was, have we received any unsolicited proposals for any of these properties? We have not. Okay, super. Uh, thank you, Carly. Thank you, Kamala. Thank, thank you, Thank you, directors. Any other directors with comments? Seeing none, I would just like to applaud the tremendous tour de force. Uh, what a project to survey uh, the five counties that we're working in and work with individual jurisdictions to uh, set out the criteria that we would use and, and do use to uh, advance a project to a development so solicitation. Um, it, it's a thorough process from my uh, perspective. And the biggest element of that process, I, I, four elements, uh, but the development capacity uh, is the largest of those with a 35% of the ranking. Could you just elaborate a little bit on what that development capacity includes? I think the other elements like uh, the uh, local support is very clear to everyone, but development capacity might need some explanation. In brief, it is how much new housing or square footage of other usage can that space accommodate given um, whatever transportation infrastructure we need to leave or space for you know, emergency vehicle access, other things like that. So it's how much can we get out of this site in terms of development. What's the biggest bang for the buck? And you know, I, I think your, your metrics are, are correct. Um, I noted that table one in the, of the BART Todd program by station, uh, it, it actually showed the year each project was complete and the total number of units and how many were affordable. And I, I went through that and popped in the uh, percent of those that were affordable, uh, added a new column at the end of the table. and and came up with the same conclusion that Carl, Kamala already mentioned, that you're really out in front uh, with the projects that are in the pre-development stage now, uh, give us a lot of optimism that we will hit those affordability targets in the future. And that's to be applauded, uh, particularly given the constraints that we're under right now and I think this is a perfect time to segue to address one of those constraints that you've already uh, brought up and we'll bring Kate, uh, Kate Hartley up to talk about the Bay Area housing measure. Welcome. Great. Um, Carl and I would like to welcome Kate Hartley, director of the Bay Area Housing Finance Authority. Uh, BAFA was created by state legislation in 2019 to implement the regional consensus developed in the CASA housing process uh, to help solve housing affordability challenges. Uh, and from the legislation, uh, BAFA is authorized to pursue funding uh, through a regional housing measure. Uh, that uh, Kate will speak to now, and they're headed towards November 2024. Uh, BAFA was purposefully embedded in the MTC ABAG to strengthen the region's planning and implementation work 
a mobility, housing, and the environment. Uh, so with that, we'll welcome Kate. Thank you so much, and good afternoon, directors. I'm really happy to be here. I'm also very happy to hear the last presentation. I um, underwrote a lot of the uh, projects myself for our Priority Sites Pre-Development Program, and so I know very intimately the work that you're doing on TOD. I love it all. It's amazing. The projects are amazing, and so um, many congratulations to you for taking the lead on that kind of great TOD housing that we so desperately need. So the Bay Area Housing Finance Authority, also known as BAFA, uh, there it is. Um, again, uh, given the last conversation, I think everybody is very well aware of the general history and the current landscape that define our housing challenges. We have not built enough housing for our residents in California for a good 50 years. We saw a very serious decline in the resources necessary to build affordable housing and to assist low-income households in America in the 80s. There's a direct line from the rise of homelessness in our cities and counties to those funding cuts and the diminishment of the safety net. Uh, and we have now 3.5 million people just in the Bay Area who are low income or very low income. Their wages, working wages of a regular person have not kept pace with the cost of housing in our region. And so we see a lot of hardship that our residents experience. And it's most starkly represented by what we see every day, 37,000 unhoused neighbors on the street, another 600,000 or so at risk of homelessness. More people live farther from their jobs. We see displacement, and it is so hard to think about, even think about owning a home if you're a young person just trying to get started. We have the lowest rate of home ownership for people under 35 in the country. And I've been talking to people all throughout the nine counties over the last 18 months or so about uh, BAFA and the bond. And in every single county, uh, small and, and medium-sized business owners uh, come forward and, and talk about just how difficult it is to attract and retain workers. So it, this is something that affects us all. M uh, BAFA was embedded in MTC and ABAG to leverage the regional planning effort. We are uh, very much seeking to work with our colleagues in that important, on that important triad of mobility, housing, and environmental sustainability. We want to be a successful implementer of the Plan Bay Area 2050 housing goals of helping to create an affordable, connected, diverse, and healthy, uh, vibrant region. So what is BAFA doing specifically? Uh, working very hard to address that 180,000 um, home, affordable home need that was just identified in the sixth cycle of our regional housing needs allocation. This is the homes that the state said we should be providing for low-income people uh, by 2031. We want to generate those resources necessary to do that, and part of our mandate is to work collaboratively with cities and counties throughout the nine counties. So BAFA was created by state legislation in 2019. Our core power is to raise revenue throughout the nine counties, and we must use that re revenue pursuant to our state statute for the three Ps, production and preservation of housing, affordable housing, and the protection of uh, tenants uh, and low-income low residents who are at risk of displacement. Again, our mandate is to be collaborative with cities and counties. We need to add value to the efforts already underway, and we also want to change those systems to the greatest extent possible so that we can do a better job. One of the key elements of systems change that really can make a difference for the region is that BAFA has the ability to be an alternate lender to commercial banks that currently participate in affordable housing development and financing. Those banks who have been partners for since at least 1986 when the um, low-income housing tax credit uh, 
uh, program was created, and that's the main vehicle for financing affordable housing today in America. Uh, they take interest in fees and they pay shareholder dividends and staff salaries and bonuses, et cetera. BAFA can become a public mortgage lender. We will take our interest in fees, become a self-sustaining organization, but importantly, be able to reinvest into communities so that we can put that interest in fee income back to use as more affordable housing and also for programmatic uh, um, uses like tenant protections. So we have the opportunity to use these potential bond funds and make them continue to uh, confer benefits to the nine counties uh, permanently. It's a, it's a really big change. We don't do that kind of financing now in the Bay Area, and BAFA is intent on making that happen. If we do that, we create a strong regional um, mortgage lender, then we can, with the income that we earn, uh, in addition to creating new affordable housing, we can uh, provide te technical assistance to community-based organizations. We can provide TA to some of the cities and counties that don't have housing departments or housing staff. We can also advance financing and development systems that help to lower the cost of housing and deliver housing faster. And we can have create a strong voice so that we can go to uh, the capital and to Sacramento and really lobby hard and advocate for um, better policies that serve our region. So the 2024 bond measure is our first start. <laughs> um, it will be 10 million our board and the which is comprised of the same members as the MTC they will find the bond it will be informed by will be in all nine counties we have a threshold right now but um, Bond, expect to be in your period in separate tranches, and all of the eligible in our statute. On the question of voter threshold, last year, as you may know, the state legislature passed Assembly Constitutional Amendment Number One, and that would lower the voter threshold for affordable housing bonds to 55%, just like it is for housing bonds. That will make a great difference. Uh, we will write our ballot measure so that we can take advantage of that should ACA 1 pass in November. BAFA will retain 20% of the funds that we raise. That's per our statute and so that we can create those regional systems that I talked a little bit about. 80% of the funds we raise go back to the county of origin according to assessed value. It's a sort of, not sort of, it is a return to source model so that the more you pay as a county for a debt service, then the more uh, funds that you get from the revenue measure. And as you can see in this slide, it shows what money will go to what county. This will be an unprecedented amount of funds for the Bay Area. We have never had this level of resource for housing across the Bay Area. Some of our counties have been successful in passing housing bonds, but not, never has everyone together working on housing. So this would truly be transformational. As I mentioned, all the ways that the funds will be dispersed and what funds can be spent on are in our statute, state law. For counties, and we do have some direct allocation cities who, because they carry 30% or more of their region's very low income RENA obligation, they get a, an allocation of their own so they can spend that money most expeditiously. So for the cities and counties, they have to use a minimum of 52% of the funds that they receive on new construction. 15% minimum must be used on preservation. So the purchase of existing buildings, converting them to affordable housing, or as some of you may have know about and experienced, 
uh, some older affordable projects have expiring use restrictions. And when that happens, people can be at risk of displacement overnight when those affor affordability restrictions expire. So the money can be used to preserve that affordability. 5% of the funds must go to tenant protections per our statute, but currently, and I know you know this really well also, um, the state constitution only allows GO bonds to be used on the acquisition or improvement of real property. So unless that changes, um, we can't use bond funds on really critical needs like tenant rental assistance. That can also be a great help to help people stay in their homes. Um, recognizing the diversity of the Bay Area, a full 28% of the funds going to cities and counties are flexible. And that means the county can decide whether to use it on production or preservation or even housing related uses. For example, if you're building a new housing development and there's a infrastructure or a sewer line or, or um, other necessary elements to make that housing development viable, you may use the funds, bond funds on that so long as uh, it's a constitutional use. BAFA, with our 20% of funds, has the same rules ex with the exception of um, a, a local government incentive grant program that we are creating. It's 10% of our funds. So we'll work with cities and counties to provide grant funds that will serve additional needs that they may have. For example, ideas put forward to us are um, some counties really need help repairing and maintaining homeless shelters that they have. In other counties, uh, they're looking for down payment assistance. So we'll be working to define the terms of that with, in collaboration with the cities and counties. So we have a very lockstep approval process to get our measure on the ballot. We have a nine member advisory committee comprised of experts in the field. They have a very heartily recommended approval. Um, we uh, visited our BAFA oversight and ABAC housing joint committees uh, in February, they approved everything that we presented to them with the exception that they um, sent us back to further negotiations with labor to um, uh, reach agreement on labor standards for the use of our 20% of funds. And we are in those discussions, they're going very well. Uh, we will have a written recommendation for our committees in April. And then a very important vo vote will take place at the ABAG Executive Board on April 18th. They'll approve our business plan, our expenditure plan with labor standards and the initiating resolution, which is um, required to put the measure on the ballot. The BAFA board will then have a public notice meeting. That's a statutory requirement in May. Final vote before the BAFA board to place the measure on the ballot will be on June 26th. So that is it, and I'm really happy to answer any questions. And I know there were some questions from the last presentation, so I can handle those as well. Thank you very much, Kate. Before we go to the board, I'd like to see if we have any public comments. No speaker cards, and I don't see any hands raised on Zoom, so we can answer everything. Okay, I'll take a look and see if I have Janice Lee in the queue. Hi, Kate. Thank you so much for being here today, and I feel like you probably see some familiar faces here um, from your lengthy time in San Francisco. Um, so yes, following up from some questions I asked Carly, but really they're for you. Um, on the last slide, you did have a timeline. Can you talk a little bit more about the process and timeline for developing county-specific expenditure plans? Like when does that happen? What does that, obviously every county determines their process, but what does that look like? Yes, um, my team, our team is doing peer-to-peer uh, training and convenings with all the county staff and the direct allocation city staff, helping them just think about, first of all, understand the statute, understand eligible uses and the process, and then think about um, the drafting of their expenditure plan. Right now is really an outreach session or an outreach phase for the counties. They are obligated when they write their expenditure plan to meet with every single city in their jurisdiction and they have to demonstrate as a statutory requirement that the expenditure plans that they write reflect the housing needs of all the cities in their counties. 
So we've been helping them think about different models, you know, just throwing some ideas out there, a, a per capita allocation or an allocation based on RENA, or you know, a half and half, one on RENA, one on per capita. Um, there's many ways to, uh, to distribute the funds, and so each county will decide how that, how that happens. So in addition to outreach to the cities, at city council meetings, um, public town halls, et cetera, <laughs> we're also um, providing template materials so that they can go out and talk to the general public and stakeholders. But their expenditure plans are not due until at the earliest, February 5th of 2025, because we know how strapped local government staff are, and we don't want to impose a burden on them, and then the bond doesn't pass. I mean, you know, <laughs> we're very hopeful that it will. Um, we're very optimistic, but um, we just want this time frame to be planning and communications and outreach, and so that when the bond does pass, they'll be ready to go, and then by February 5th or later, our boards will set the date that the expenditure plans are due. They will have the, um, done all the groundwork to submit those. So there's lots of time to plan. And so obviously at the county and the local jurisdiction, like at the local city council level, they have a lot of power. However, the folks who actually own land that's developable are folks like us, right? Is there, um, like, are there recommendations at the Boffler MTC level about, like, how they engage with folks like BART or other major, especially public institutions that happen to own land? I know SFMTA, for example, owns land in San Francisco. Like, the SFUSD owns, like, a ton of really random land as well. And they, you know, I'm thinking about, like, former Mayor Lee is, like, public sites for housing, like, that kind of approach. Um, so I guess we're weird because we're a special district and we don't fit neatly into that kind of outreach that happens. So where does transit district like BART get to fit in into the expenditure plan creation process? Well, what I have advised um, cities, city councils, um, and other stakeholders, um, and BART is a really good example of this, this, is, this should not be a passive process. Um, the city, some cities have expressed concern that their needs, while they may f put, m push them forward to the county, the county won't, um, won't listen. But um, that, that assumes that the county has full control. So our advice to all stakeholders is make your, make your voice known. You, I mean, I know that um, from our priority sites work and from the amazing um, TOD development that's already going on, there, there is in many places full engagement with BART, with other transit agencies, with um, landholders that uh, has been going on for a long time. So as the counties and the cities begin to think about, okay, we're gonna have resources at a level we never had them before, what's our, you know, what's the most effective, most impactful work that we can do? And so, um, so for BART, I think really engaging in those cities where you see potential that maybe had stalled because of a lack of resources, that would be very, um, very great to engage on those with the city, the city then with the county, and just um, pushing that forward. I've also advised the cities to come together themselves as a group to put forward ideas about what they think is the best way to distribute funds, like, for example, a per capita distribution mm -hmm. with a timeline so that any city that doesn't spend, um, the money goes back into the pool. So there's lots of ways to do it, and the main, the main important points of how to go about it is just communication and collaboration. Yeah. Um, okay, I have a couple more questions here. Um, so. I, I do think based on that comment, I would really encourage us as a board to think about like what are letters that we can write to local jurisdictions like and figure out the right time to do that when the expenditure plan process is actually developed and you know, we'll see what happens in November, all of that. Um, but I do want to be very aggressive. I'm looking at you, Carly, sorry. I, I wanna be really aggressive at inserting ourselves into the process for this, for housing because we always know what those benefits, whether it's safety, whether it's ridership, whether revenue and other things that we, we, yeah, we already know, TOD is great for BART. Um, okay, 
The other question I have for you, Kate, is at both the regional and county level, this housing bond, as you said, is going to like fundamentally change the amount of dollars there are for housing production, preservation. Um, but of course, counties already have existing funds for housing. I am constantly looking at the numbers, but it looks like the housing bond will pass, Prop A will pass in San Francisco, which is great. Um, but you know, there are already existing funds, whether that's for production, but also tenant protections, other you know, housing programs, et cetera, to you know, help folks be able to stay in their homes. What are the conversations like right now, or is there room um, to think about how existing funds can be swapped around so that more existing and flexible funds can be spent on non-capital programs given the inflexibility of the housing bond funds? So I, don't, I feel like it's a little demeaning to call it the fund stuff, but like, where, how are there ways to be able to fund that? And my real dream is to create something like the ASIC program at a regional level, but I know that none of those housing bond dollars could go for the transit um, demand management and the transit capital stuff just because of the statutory requirements already. But are there ways to swap things around, you know, or, you know, what's that conversation been like? Um, I would say not really um, because of statutory requirements. I, um, the, so most cities and counties have housing sources that uh, come from the federal government, CDBG and HOM, very prescribed. Um, some, uh, some cities and counties have inclusionary fees or jobs housing linkage fees. Those also are very uh, like sharply pre uh, prescribed housing trust funds. I mean, every time there's the creation of a new fund for housing, it is usually done in a legislative fas fashion that attaches rules to it that makes it very hard yeah. for cities and counties to be flexible. And, and the tax credit system that funds 95% of everything we do is especially inflexible. Uh, so there, yes, it is, it is problematic. I think it's one of the reasons that we have um, the housing uh, deficits that we have today. Uh, one thing that I'm encouraged about is if BAFA, and this is a longer term vision, but in a, over a 10 year period, we, ha we hope to have resources that can offer us more flexibility in the housing realm. We still have to be compliant with our statute, but um, you know, we, we would be able to fund, say, a tenant protections program. The flexible component of the, um, of the bond measure is very new. And so the idea that you could spend housing money on infrastructure work that's not directly on the parcel that you are developing is a big change in the way that most of the um, most of the funds that we have access to uh, currently allow. So the broader sort of you know mobility, housing, environmental um, triad that where you know we could sort of create our own one-stop shop about addressing all of those things with a certain resource. Um, that is a, a good vision for us to pursue. <laughs> And we could change the Constitution. I mean, ACA 1 mm -hmm. uh, is amending the Constitution. And our hope was that in addition to lowering the voter threshold, there would be some room to include tenant protections yep. as an eligible expense. The, the, the measure is being amended right now, but it is looking likely that it won't be that more expansive view that we hoped for, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't do that at some point. Yeah, I, I guess the comment here, and you already know this, but like programs like ASIC are great because it recognizes when you build more housing, especially affordable housing, you also need to fund the surrounding infrastructure, especially transportation and transit infrastructure. And what is so great about ASIC is it not only gets us a bunch of train cars and transit improvements, bus stops, et cetera, but it's also funding transit ops, and that is really, you know, the crux of the problem that all transit agencies across the country are facing. So the ways that we can tie increased housing and density specifically at transit and be also able to fund transit operations is like the dream, right? And so that's my goal. Okay, I have one really, one last question, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, 
So this question is, and it's sort of like following from some of the comments I made around the, the arena goals. Um, you know, I, I'm a little bit concerned that some of the BAFA dollars are going to ultimately bail out certain jurisdictions that maybe haven't been the best actors around housing and are a bit housing resistant. Um, and so while, you know, you're saying that money is going to go back to the county of origin based on, you know, you had the charts and you showed, you know, how it's going to be all mapped out. But even within the counties, there are some really great actors who are really, really open to housing and some very housing resistant jurisdictions. You know, what is BAFA doing to ensure that the good actors, and I would like to point, you know, we're, we're good actors, we, we really want to help, you know, be part of the solution here. How are you ensuring that there, you know, is a good balance here and that BAFA isn't just bailing out communities who aren't doing their own work and building housing and also supporting really communities that are very pro-housing and might even want to go above and beyond their arena obligations? I, I wouldn't, um, I don't think it's an, um, it's an apt description to say that this bond could in any way bail out anybody. I mean, it's, 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 not, it's just not the case that the distribution of funds with a specific intent to build more affordable housing and an obligation on that county to build affordable housing is, um, is, a, is a bailout. Um, I have been in every single county extensively over the last two years, and I can tell you that we are all joined by the problems of housing unaffordability and homelessness. Every single county. Every single county has a pipeline of, pre of homes, affordable homes in pre-development that are unfunded. Uh, all nine. So there is, uh, I mean, there are some pockets within our communities that um, we've seen through the RENA process say, you know, no, we're, uh, we don't want affordable housing. We're a single family enclave. We need to keep it that way. And that may be an area where it's, you know, the, the fight is either not worth it or not um, something um, that we could all win. But that doesn't mean that that county overall doesn't have affordable housing needs and desperate affordable housing needs and the ability to create really great housing opportunities close to transit, close to schools, services, keep people in their homes. So um, I think that uh, given the responses we've received from all the boards of supervisors, very enthusiastic, so many city councils, really enthusiastic. I've been to so many meetings of um, mayors and city council members throughout the region. They want the money. <laughs> Um, because they are taking the arena obligations seriously, but more importantly, they are hearing from their constituents, seniors on fixed incomes, families where the young, you know, adult children ha can't live here, uh, homelessness for sure, and those um, business owners who can't retain staff. Also essential, gov essential services like nurses and doctors and um, teachers, that our, our communities are really struggling to keep those jobs filled. So I'm really, um, really uh, heartened by the responses that we've got, and I know we're going to, as a region, spend that money really well, even though we still continue to deal with NIMBYism, for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you, <laughs> colleagues, for allowing me questions. Um, and yeah, thank you for making time to come before us here today. You're welcome, Director Lee. Director Salzman. I just wanted to say thank you for the work on this. This is incredibly important. As you said, it's tied to our last presentation. It's important to BART being able to meet its goals. Um, and I think how it's set up, you know, anybody who hasn't built housing so far, they're, they're going to have to do it to get this funding. So if it incentivizes some places that haven't done it, that's great. And I want to point out, you know, the county where I live in Contra Costa, unlike Alameda and um, San Francisco, and maybe some other counties, there hasn't been funding, specific local funding for affordable housing. And so there are cities that are ready to build affordable housing, but to just have to rely on state and federal tax credits, it's a lot better to be able to leverage local funds. So I think this is really a game changer for the counties that just haven't been able to or haven't been appetite for a local funding measure. So really excited about it and thank you. Thank you. I, 
looking at your presentation, and I, a number that caught my attention was the three and a half million low income residents in the Bay Area. I believe our total population's around eight million right now. So that's, that's an incredible number to deal with. And proposing that we have by 2031, uh, 181,000 units to house those most in need. And so it, it comes down to how we allocate and prioritize. And when I was buoyed by your comment overarching that mobility, housing, and environments, the, the goals, but the state through statutes, particularly SB 375, has set out criteria that we use for planning and uh, the sustainable communities strategy, basically, and developing priority development areas uh, that can be sustained. Uh, what my concern is, and particularly with the 80% that would go to local jurisdictions and counties, would be to have folks turn their back on priority development areas. And so I, my question is, will there be any compliance requirements uh, put into the allocation of these funds? Will it follow Plan Bay Area? Um, put me at ease on this. Sure. I, I don't want to see a, a Solano New City uh, gobble up all of the funds for when we have real needs that could be uh, built and sustained here in, say, Alameda County and in the core areas. Um, so that's a complex question, and I have to start just by um, sort of laying the groundwork for our statute. We, uh, we BAFA can't impose um, requirements, qualitative requirements on the jurisdiction's expenditure of funds beyond what is included in the statute. And so there are affordability restrictions, there are deed uh, covenant restrictions, um, there are definitional restrictions about what the cities and, and counties can do, what kind of housing. But we can't say to them, we're not going to give you the money unless you build in a PDA. However, I will give you some good news, and that is the results of the fifth RENA cycle shows that the, the, vast ma the majority of all development uh, in that cycle was in PDAs. And so there is an acknowledgement, there is a... Um, there is a concerted regional response that that is where the housing is building. We, uh, is being built. We will be, BAFA, really out in front, setting funding guidelines for our 20% um, expenditures that are based on principles defined in our business plan and our equity framework, including environmental justice goals, including environmental sustainability goals, Transit-oriented development will be a very important part of our expenditures. We're going to be in all nine counties, and so uh, we will be setting forth those um, examples of the development that I, you're describing as, as transit-oriented and um, environmentally sound. So we believe that um, given the responses that we've had to date, and also that the, um, in these counties with direct allocations of funds, uh, including Santa Rosa and the city of Napa, that there will be a focus on the areas building uh, densely in areas where low-income people live and close to services. And the other thing is that our funds need to be leveraged with, will be leveraged with low-income housing tax credits and bonds, all of which have um, uh, certain amenity requirements to be competitive, and that is proximity to that includes proximity to services and transit. And so, when you start layering these requirements on, then I think that we uh, really move away from the idea that there will be, you know, certain counties building in the WUI 
Bowie or, you know, like promoting sprawl or um, building in ways that uh, are not environmentally sustainable. Uh, so we're expecting to see the vast majority of funds spent in dense multifamily housing um, because that's what's going to be required to meet the goals of the statute and the, the program. And I think in the final analysis, it's going to be up to organizations like BART and other, and of course, environmental groups to remind planners that this is what we want. And, you know, you can combat the nimbyism with a more, much more positive message about what can be achieved. And building 180,000 units could really address so many issues uh, that we have in the Bay Area, and, and it's essential that we get there. But it will pay extra dividends if it's done right. Agreed. And um, we, we had a meeting with our joint committees just yesterday. We had advocates from, for example, the Greenbelt Alliance and Transform. Their, their voices are being heard. They are all over this bond. <laughs> and so we expect there to be quite a lot of advocacy at the county level. They're certainly advocating for us, but we've already made our intentions clear in our business plan. So. Um, we are uh, very hopeful that this funding will help us achieve those broader goals of Plan Bay Area because there's so much expressed desire to, to meet, meet that vision. And I'm sure that it's the intention of the planners you're sitting with that we continue to submit those ASIC grants applications and work with the local community so that they can see that if they apply for those housing funds. It doesn't just stop there, but they can actually build a, a tremendous, a, a lot more than they might be thinking of at the moment. So thank you so much for your presentation. Do we have any? Director Ames. Is oh, there. I see. I'm sorry, Director Ames. Thank you. Go right I'll, ahead. I'll be quick. Um, so can we use some of this money if we're building a housing development on BART property and say 20% is affordable, can we add to that and do like 80% average median income on top of the 20% affordable? So it's still affordable, but I mean, I'm looking for more of a balanced income level type housing model. Yes, uh, the, the money that BAFA has, controls is uh, we have a maximum income cap of 80% of area median income. The maximum income cap for the counties and cities funds is 120% of area median income. Now the cities and counties are obligated to prioritize investments in developments that meet their extremely low, very low, and low income RENA goals, but that accounts for about 45% of the RENA allocation. So there's um, a priority for very low income, low income and below, but then there's additional funds also that could be used uh, at that higher income level. For example, we know that some counties will most certainly provide down payment assistance loan programs for first time homeowners and you need a higher um, income level for that. So, yeah, so the answer is yes, there's flexibility. Um, what we are not, um, what is not uh, allowed is that if there's an inclusionary housing obligation in a development, say 15% of units by ordinance in the locality must be affordable, the bond funds should not be used to pay the market rate developers' um, cost of that inclusionary. But if you want to go from 15 to 30, you can use the bond funds for that incremental um, bump in the market rate development. Okay, that's really good. Um, and then I do like the job housing nexus. I know there's no com a lot of compliance in this measure, but to me this is an environmental sustainability issue because we're not building that average median income housing. They're, they can buy a house in the Central Valley and they're super commuting, and it's really a quality of life environmental problem. 
So I'm hopeful that we can start to look at those kind of uh, formulas, combining average median income, like 180%, 120% um, type housing. And then you've got the market rate. Because the market rate, to me, is what's driving all the rents up um, throughout the whole region. So uh, thank you very much for this information. And I, yeah, I look forward to hearing more. This is a very complex discussion, but I'll try to navigate this. Thank you. Thank you, Director Ames, and President Dufty has, would like the final word. Well, first, let me welcome you to BART. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, whenever I see your name, I smile, because I think of the family we house together, and they're doing great. I just saw them last week. Um, and I just want to say thank you for the fact that the regional housing measure is going to really inform how we approach our, our regional transportation measure. And so at some points, I've kind of wished that there was reverse order, but now I, th I see the zen of it and that um, it really is going to help us a great deal. And so I hope that we continue to have a dialogue through the rest of this year and as we move forward. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And that closes the PPAL committee. Thank you to all of our presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for leading us through this discussion. Um, I neglected to call up um, general public comment item eight. And so our plan will be as follows. We will have general public comment, and then we will take a 20-minute recess for lunch. And then we will come back and we will do the administration items led by Director Lee. And um, then uh, Vice Chair Ames will lead us through the engineering and operations items. So that will be the, um, the schedule. And do we have any general public comment speakers? Yes, I didn't receive any speaker cards, but we do have a hand raised on Zoom. Alita, please go ahead. Um, thanks again, uh, President Bevan Dufty. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her with Team Bowles uh, as I speak uh, generally. Uh, I was on the system uh, over the weekend, uh, worked fine. Uh, I'm amazed that the cell phone reception works in the tunnels. About two weeks ago, I actually was able to change an airplane ticket on my phone while riding through the Oakland Y deep underground. So uh, that's very good thing, very helpful uh, because things change and I gotta make plans. And um, you know, I, I often talk about standing and respect and I, I wrote some things about that too in a letter. And I want us to have the most equitable part that we have. You know, I get three minutes now or sometimes two if you have to have things back. But some people get more. You know, why is that? And I thought to myself, uh, is what I say not as important? Uh, am I not as important? I ask that you not forget the ordinary users of the system. Uh, I don't have longstanding incumbency in California. Uh, but, but I would be really upset if somebody told me go back to New York. Uh, you know, because I, I enjoy BART, and, and BART, uh, I had some good rides on BART. And sometimes I'm afraid of coming to BART meetings, because, because sometimes I get disrespected at the door. Uh, that must not happen. Uh, th that stops now. Uh, because I want to approach a BART where people will know what to do with me. And, and I mentioned in my letter, there are lots of good people at BART. I, I really have enjoyed uh, interacting with people from uh, Lake Merritt Customer Service Center and had some wonderful conversations with people from uh, Capital Carter. And, and there, are, there are lots and lots of people at BART, uh, very good people that I enjoy being around. But, but see, you never know. Policies give scant comfort because uh, policies are just that. They're only as good as the people who, who follow them. And, and yes, I'm very different. I'm an unrepentant user of autonomous vehicles. Probably a lot of people don't like me over that. Well, I got to be who I am. Uh, it's perfectly legal to ride autonomous vehicles, so I'm going to keep doing that. And I, I use them to get to and from BART. Um, so I continue to emphasize the importance of, of equity and welcome. 
on any system of public transportation. I take BART very seriously, uh, just as I take many other things. I ask you remember this, BART is the people's system. Thank you. Thank you. No additional hands. Thank you. So we will go into a 20 minute recess and come back and complete our agenda. Thank you so much.
Director, we are ready uh, to move forward with uh, Pam's committee. Thank you, and we're returning from our, our brief recess, and we're going to move on to the administration items, and the chair of that committee is Director Janice Lee. Thank you, President Dufty. Uh, thank you, staff, for being patient with us. Um, we just have one item for administration, and that's the fiscal year 2024 second quarter financial report. So, Pam, please take it away. Thank you, and good afternoon. While the district secretary pulls up the presentation, I'll just introduce you to the item. <coughs> The quarterly financial report for the second quarter of fiscal year 24 is an information item. This report is a combined effort between the offices of performance and budget and the controller treasurer. You may recall that previously performance and budgets quarterly financial report was a short memo with a one page financial summary. And to be honest, it was challenging to walk through in a board meeting. So now joining with the controller treasurer's quarterly report format of a presentation, we have slides where we can more easily walk you through the quarterly budget and actuals, year-end projections and variance explanations. Um, we'll continue in the report to cover the uh, BART's post-employment benefits, obligations, cash investments, receivables, liabilities, and reserves. And I should also note that as Chris Gann, our interim control and treasurer, Chris Simi, the budget director, and our teams prepared this first combined report, we identified a number of areas where we already see that we want to make additional improvements. And we welcome any feedback from you on any items that you would like to see as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chris Simi uh, <coughs> for the first part of the presentation, and then Chris Gann for the end. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. And uh, good, good afternoon, uh, directors. So I'm just going to go ahead here. So on this slide, you can see how we've organized this new report that, that Pam was just talking about. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to walk us through the budget to actuals portion, that sort of top bit there of the presentation, and I'm going to turn it over to Chris Gann, who's going to go through what we traditionally call the uh, controller treasurer report. And so uh, as, as Pam alluded to, we were, had some issues showing all this stuff the last time, so we thought we'd put it into a proper presentation this time and, and try to make it uh, a little clearer for everybody. And so you will be familiar, of course, with this layout from our quarterly financial reports. But let me take a second to just orient you. This slide shows operating sources and the uses of net result follow. Green columns show budgeted amounts, while the teal shows actuals through the end of Q2, or December 31, 2023. The difference between budget and actuals, the variance, is in dark blue. The orange columns uh, at the end there, or on the right side, show the, our projections for the end of this fiscal year. Operating revenues are at the top, while financial assistance is below. And I'll make a couple of notes here. First is that ridership remains, uh, and the GM said this earlier today, but you know, really largely on budget and is projected to do so through the end of the fiscal year. Non-operating revenue um, is doing better than budget due to interest on BART's cash primarily. You'll see where we placed our cash and what interest it is uh, returning later in this presentation when other Chris, Chris Gann speaks. Um, but it has definitely been a bright spot for us on the revenue side. And finally, you may see that state transit assistance, which we call STA, has not come in yet this fiscal year, but we do project it to significantly exceed budget by fiscal year end. It's simply a uh, timing of payments issue we are looking to iron out in next year's budget calendarization. So all in the takeaway here is that through Q2, our revenues are almost $20 million ahead of budget, and we expect to be about $50 million above budget by year end. I'll move on to expense now. This slide is also laid out like the previous ones. And so looking from top to bottom, we have labor followed by non-labor and then debt service and allocations. The big story here, of course, is our lagging capital reimbursements, which we uh, discussed at the previous QFR presentation. And so you can see that between $68.1 million in regular wages and fringe, combined with $7.9 million in overtime, capital reimbursements are projected to be about $76 million off budget by fiscal year end. This is a major issue, and I'm going to come back to it uh, in detail in a few slides. The other two items, uh, or the other items of note here, are our attraction power costs. We previously anticipated spending less on this item than budgeted due to lower energy demand from shorter trains. 
With recent electric transmission and distribution cost increases, we now project to be on budget instead of under budget by fiscal year end. It's an item we are monitoring closely, and I know Power Division has been in contact with you, with you about it. Finally, on the allocations line, you will see savings projected coming from the rail car contingency, which we discussed before, so I won't, I won't talk about here. To summarize, by fiscal year end, we are projecting nearly $50 million in negative variance on our labor costs, which is offset by almost $22 million in savings elsewhere, primarily from the rail car contingency. That leaves us with a projected $27.4 million overspend for the year. So I'll now move on to the net result to see how it all shakes out. And this slide sums up everything so you can see how we did through Q2 and how we expect to do by the end of June. So as I've alluded to, we anticipate ending the year about $50 million better than budget on revenue and $27.4 million over budget on expense. The net there means we will need $23 million less emergency assistance than we budgeted, so that is good news. And I do want to quickly note here uh, that the bottom bullet on the right uh, was actually mailed out to you with a typo, and so that's been corrected here to show the correct number. The tables and all the other numbers are unchanged, and, and my apologies about that typo. Okay, so I won't spend much time on this slide, but we wanted to kind of put it in the, uh, provide as part of mail out so people can see how we are doing on emergency assistance. I like to note that it's no longer federal emergency assistance. We now have state and regional money there, so we're just calling it emergency assistance. We have now drawn down all of our federal assistance. That's CARES, CRISA, and ARP, though it hasn't all been used to offset expenses yet. We're showing our first award of $58 million of SB 125 state and regional assistance, and I'll draw your attention to the asterisk at the bottom there, which is that we anticipate a total of $352 million over the next couple of years to be allocated from that source. And of course, we continue to advocate aggressively for uh, any and all additional funding. Okay, so now let's look at the really sort of big issue in our quarterly report here as, as we try to uh, close this off. And so that's capital reimbursements. And as you can see in the first bullet, uh, and as I said earlier, we are off budget by about 35%, uh, which is very significant and something we are working uh, very quickly to, to correct. And so just to recap sort of the, the context here, right? BART delivers a significant amount of capital work with our own labor, i.e. BART employees. This means their salaries are paid uh, not by our operating budget, but by other sources via reimbursements such as you know, RR or FTA, State of Good Repair funding. And so there are two big drivers of the variance here. The good news is that about 40%, maybe 45%, I would say, of this has no impact on the operating budget, and I'll start with that. And you can read on the second bullet there, but basically, we overestimated how much we would spend on capital labor this year. It has nothing to do with project delivery or anticipated hours, but rather how our budget team calculated the cost associated with those hours. What it means is that about $35 million more, the sum of the first two lines in the table, uh, was assumed than should have been. However, since none of those costs should have been budgeted in the first place, they're neither being paid out nor being reimbursed. And since they net out to zero, there is no operating budget impact. The remainder, unfortunately, does impact the operating budget. Uh, over the past two years, a number of staff in our maintenance department who were originally brought on with the intention of delivering capital work, so think electricians, welders, equipment operators, positions like that, have been reassigned to operating funded work. It's been driven mostly by the needs of keeping the railroad running and delivering quality service to passengers, and it's been the right move to maintain system safety and reliability. What it also means, however, is that these employees' time has not been reimbursed by capital sources, and their costs have been hitting the operating budget as they've been doing operating work. And you can see that impact on the third row there for $32 million. And so that is really the, the primary driver of our negative labor variance on the operating side this fiscal year. So the next slide, we'll talk about what we're doing about this. And so, as you can imagine, over $30 million a year of potential impact to our fiscal runway is very substantial. And when we announced our allocation of $352 million of SB 125 funding in October, we made it clear that it was enough emergency assistance for BART to effectively close our deficits through the end of FY26. And the GM has been clear that that remains the case, and that is his expectation. So as we look to the preliminary budget, which will be released in two weeks, we will be implementing a number of actions to mitigate this impact and keep that runway about where, where it has been. And some of the potential things we're looking at, uh, 
that are under consideration are listed at, on that sort of bottom third of the slide here. I will also say, you know, one big caveat here is that this is, um, I hate to use this term, it's like, it's like a fluid situation, right? These numbers do change. So the, the data that we're showing here, the report that we ran, goes through December 31st. However, that was, you know, two and a half months ago. And so we have started to see some impact, uh, especially on the second to last bullet, where, you know, trying to do additional capital work to reimburse, uh, to increase our reimbursements. Uh, Shane and Sylvia have been optimizing their work schedules to squeeze in more capital hours wherever possible, and we are starting to see some results in our preliminary February numbers, which are not, not closed yet, so we don't want to speak too much to them. They've also scheduled additional work over the coming 12 plus months. So in other words, while, I don't, while we're not adjusting uh, the projection as of the end of Q2, the negative variance projection for year end might come down in the coming months. We do not, of course, want to promise anything there. It's something we're watching closely and we'll keep you updated on. And just to close this out, you know, I just want to reiterate that the preliminary budget you will see in two weeks will include a number of actions to mitigate the impact, maintain the fiscal runway, and have a really a more accurate look of, you know, what the cap, a, a more accurate, I should say, budget of capital labor reimbursements for 25, 26, and going forward, really trying to correct that and reduce those variances. So with that, um, I'm going to turn this over to Chris Gann now, who will take you through the rest of this presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, directors. Uh, <clears throat> this is Chris Kian, uh, interim controller treasurer. So um, to start uh, uh, for this portion uh, of the quarterly report, uh, I just want to point out uh, some of the information presented gets updated only annually uh, due to availability of information. Uh, one data point that falls into this category is um, information rela related to the fund funded status of our pension obligations, which gets updated based on actuarial, actuarial reports provided by CalPERS once a year. Uh, Chris, can you speak into the microphone a bit more? Thank you. Yes. So for this quarter, um, the only update on this slide is um, the, the value on our Section 115 pension trust, um, which grew by 1.7 million during the quarter uh, due to uh, gain from uh, um, the market. For other post-employment obligations, the latest valuation report as of June 30, 2023 for the Retiree Health Benefit uh, Trust showed that we are now 70.5% funded, an increase of 4.1% from the previous valuation, driven mostly by 56 million increase in the market value of the assets of the trust. As reflected by the orange bar, the asset of the RHVT increased from 450 million in fiscal year 22 to 506 million in fiscal year 23. Uh, the return on investments for the trust in fiscal year 23 was 11.3%. The increase in assets was partially offset by a 40.6 mil, 40 million increase in total liability, which grew from 677 million to 718 million. Net unfunded liability of the trust decreased by 15.7 million from 227 million in fiscal year 22 to, to um, 211.8 million in fiscal year 23. So, um, similar to the RHBT, the assets of the Survivors Benefit Trust had also had a positive return of 10.8% in fiscal year 23. The market value of the Survivors Benefit Trust increased by 1.4 million from 9.5 million in fiscal year 22 to 10.9 million in fiscal year 23. Total liability declined slightly uh, by 44,000, leading to a 1.4 million reduction, reduction in unfunded liability. So as of June 30, 2023, our Survivors Benefit Plan is 51.9% funded it's up from 45% uh, funded from the previous uh, valuation. Uh, 
So this is a, a, a snapshot of the current market value of the assets of the RHBT, uh, the Survivors Benefit Trust, and our Section 115 Pension Trust as of December 31, uh, 2023. So as you can see, all of the trusts experience a favorable investment return uh, for the quarter and then December 31. Uh, the assets of the RHBT had a gain of 48.6 million, uh, a 9.7% return. Uh, the Survivors Benefit Trust reported a gain of 985,000, or 9.5%. And the Section 115 Pension Trust reported a gain of 1.7 million, or 4.5%. So compared to the values reported in the valuation report shown in the previous page, uh, the assets of the RHBT increased by 44 million. Uh, so this is between June uh, to December. So our assets in the, the trust increased by 44 million. For the Survivors Benefit Trust, it also increased by 947,000. And our Section 115 Pension Trust increased by 1.5 million. So our total build grants receivable that were outstanding as of December 31, 2023, was 108.6 million. About 53% or 57 million are current. Uh, as of today, uh, about 79% or 86.1 million of the total receivables had been received. Of the current outstanding uh, um, balance of 57.2 million, 99% or 57 million had been collected. Of the non-current portion or non-current receivables, 18.6 million or 98% of the total 18.9 million over 31 to 60 days had been received. We've all received 100% of the receivables between 61 to 90 days. And 39% uh, or 8.2 million of the receivables outstanding over 121 days. So our total cash and investments at the end of December is 1.01 uh, billion. Uh, and consistent with uh, prior quarters, about 87% of our cash in the general fund and working capital fund are invested in US government securities. Uh, the weighted average yield on our investments were slightly higher compared to the previous quarter. Um, the yield on uh, the government, government securities increased from 5.15% in the prior quarter to 5.27% in the second quarter of the fiscal year. As mentioned by Chris on slide three, uh, this, uh, the increase in uh, the yield on our investments is uh, contributing uh, positively to our uh, operating budget. Uh, you probably remember that a year and a half ago, the interest on our investments is below 1%. So now we're earning 5.27%. Uh, so as uh, breaking, breaking down our cash in investments, as of December 31, 2023, are about 45 million of uh, the balance are restricted and 965 million are unrestricted. The portion of cash and investments associated with uh, capital fund was 400 million, and of this amount, about two thirds or 251 million had been allocated to projects. So, for our uh, long term obligations or debt, uh, there's no uh, changes during this quarter uh, because principal payments are made for the, our sales of revenue bonds in July. And, in, uh, and for the geo bonds, they are, the principal payments are paid in August. So between uh, October and December, there were no principal payments. Uh, between October uh, to December 2023, the district's operating and other reserves dis decreased slightly by 7.9 million. Our operating reserves, for economic uncertainty funded by the emergency relief grants from the FTA declined by 5.2 million to 424.87 million dollars. 
We used 63.5 million to balance the operating shortfall in the second quarter of fiscal year 24, compared to 58.5 million we took in from the grant. Uh, to date, the entire balance of 1.6 billion in federal emergency relief grant had been fully <coughs> recognized in our books. Um, during this quarter, we also utilized in full the 5.4 million previously allocated for EBART operations. We brought it back to operating budget. Uh, the utilization of the reserves during the quarter were offset by the increase in working capital reserve, which grew by 983,000, primarily from interest income. And our section 115 pension trust increased by 1.7 million. Uh, this ends my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chris and Chris. Um, before we go to any board comments, let's first see if there's any public comment. No speaker cards received, but we do have a hand raised on Zoom. Alita, please go ahead. Um, thank you, uh, Committee Chair Janice Lee. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her with Team Falls. I'm going to talk about this uh, presentation. Um, I mean, we're managing. Uh, first of all, I did notice the past due balances. It looks like there's not as much past due over 120 days, but we really have to work on that. Uh, I, I know this, that if I didn't pay my electric bill for 120 days, they already would have turned the power off, turned the electricity off. So. Uh, uh, how can we make sure we get that that money? Because uh, paying your bills on time is is a measure of credibility. I take that very seriously. So we got to ask SFMTA 12.3 million why they're behind. Okay, enough about that. And I appreciate the uh, mention about the traction power. Uh, that's very important. I even have my own power bill up here. I mentioned to you that I have electricity in my own name, so I think I'm qualified to speak about this. So so how, how can we work on uh, procuring our power? I mean, we are buying the greenhouse gas-free and renewable power, but um, apparently there's some mention about transmission and, and how can we really get uh, get some control over, over that? I, I guess we don't have our own transmission system like... Uh, Amtrak does. Uh, we should. Um, that's another thing for another time. And uh, in reading about pension liability, well, I don't understand it much. What little I do know is that I am concerned that uh, we're not getting the return that we could uh, if we are fully funded. I don't know how we're going to get there. And as we develop uh, this budget, you know, we're we're deal we're getting some assistance. Uh, from the state. Uh, I, I hope that you're not going to be proposing another fare increase uh, this year. And I hope that we're not going to cur curtail our reduced fare programs. Uh, Clipper Start needs to continue. And the 62.5% uh, senior and disability discount uh, absolutely needs to continue. So I don't want us to be proverbially uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul to, to make this happen, because it must never come at the expense of most in need. Uh, so overall, uh, we're trying, but I, I feel that we need to be tighter with some things. Uh, this is a railroad, and uh, I ask that we not forget that. But more so, whenever we're dealing with money, I ask that you remember this, is to why, why do I care about the money as much as I do? Uh, it's because BART is indeed the people's system. Thank you. I don't see any additional hands raised. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Alita, for your comments. Um, I mean, we're going to have the prelim budget memo come out in a couple of weeks' time. And to my understanding, there are absolutely no efforts to roll back already approved low-income programs um, I'm seeing. Um, our deputy general manager and general manager sort of agreeing to that. Um, all right. Do I have any other, uh, any board members who would like to speak on this item? Uh, yep. We'll go with uh, Director, uh, VP Foley. Thank you, Chair Lee. Um, two questions. Um, on slide three, 
and I apologize for not asking this during my briefing. On slide three, the net passenger revenue, we're looking at around 226 million or so, it looks like for the fiscal year. But we also, on slide 20, we have a debt service payment of about 213 million. So they're within the, within the ballpark of each other, I would say. Is that fair to draw a conclusion between those two or a line? The, the fair revenue and the debt service payments are actually not linked. No, but my point is we're bringing in 225 million, but we're paying 213 of that to debt service. Between the, uh, uh, the sales tax backed bonds and the property tax geo bonds, yes. Sure. My point is just that we're, passenger revenue is struggling to cover our debt service payment. That's just, again, I know we're, we understand that there are challenges. Um, the other question I had was, would the increase in, well, would the recognition of folks that are, really should be on the operating side of the house, then say the capital side, how does that impact the cost neutrality of our service changes from September? Is, does that, and the increase in energy costs, does that make that not as, well, obviously it's not, but what kind of impact does that have on the, the benefit of changing the schedule? Sure, uh, happy to answer that. So first, with the, the energy increases, it's just it's simply a, uh, an increase that's being passed on to us uh, from, from our, our utility. Understood. Providers has nothing to do with the power that we're procuring, it's just getting it to us. So, sure. um, you know, it would, it, our traction power uh, projections, if we were running 10 car trains, would be exceeding budget. So it's sort of, we got under budget and now we're gonna be back on budget, but if we were running 10 car trains, it would be exceeding the budget. With respect to the maintenance positions, you know, a lot of what they do is is not, it's, it's not like, you know, train operators and station agents, it's not necessarily sure. tied to the service level. So there's no, I wouldn't say there's there's a, a direct link there between those two things. Okay, I thank you for the clarification on that. All right, that's all I had, thanks. Director Ames. Slide seven, if you don't mind. Um, okay, so I guess I just wanted to just make sure we're on the same page, but um, so Shane and Sylvia are gonna be optimizing their work schedules because we moved positions to operating, 32 positions, which we don't want to do, typically. Just I, wanted like, like the high level. Assessment. Sure, I wouldn't say is that we, we don't want to move the positions to operating. I think it's that these these individuals, and these are you know BART employees at this point, um, it's not sort of vacant FTEs that we're moving around. Um, they have been doing operating work, and so what uh, Shane and Sylvia and, and you know a lot of us around the district are working on is more sort of finding more opportunities for people who have been doing operating work to also do some capital work to sort of um, offset that cost where possible and also do better better project delivery. And that's just kind of an ongoing coordination that, that they do. Um, but we're sort of adding this new lens of, let's see how this is affecting the operating budget. Okay. Just just one other add to augment, uh, Mr. Simi. Yeah, they, these folks are doing operating work right now, uh, Director Ames. So it's, you know, we should not have them in a capital headcount if they're actually doing operating work. What's it allowing Shane to do? is plan out his PMs better, plan out the state of good repair better than you know we would have otherwise. But they are doing operating work as we speak. They're doing operating work, but I guess um, my understanding is, yeah, because of the project delivery or whatever the reasons, we, we didn't do as much. We didn't have, uh, that's good that we have these quarterly reports because it kind of highlights this issue, right? And then you're saying, okay, we need to address this. So addressing it is, what you were saying is optimizing this work schedule. So it's more of a balance between capital and operating is what we're gonna see over the next two years. Or maybe we're gonna see it soon because it's happening right now, this quarter, or this you know, last quarter. So I'm just hoping to see some progress in this area sooner than later, not. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely, quarter. it's something we've been We've been working on and tracking pretty closely since uh, back in September, actually. Oh, okay. um, yeah, but this this here is really just about putting putting these these BART employees on the correct the correct budget so that 
so it's, it sort of lines up and, and it sort of more transparently shows uh, and correctly shows sort of where where people are. I mean, I, I do understand that if there's an emergency, you gotta you gotta mobilize operations to fix the emergency. And to me, this is what it says to me that we want to address the emergencies. We don't want to stall service. We got to keep the system running as maximum as possible, no delays. So I understand what's happening. I just hope that we get a better description of this next quarter, because right now we're just saying optimize. No, we don't know what that means. All right, thank you. Are there any other directors who want to speak? Um, I just had a question to also better understand, you know, slides seven and eight. If I'm understanding correctly, is this sort of like the undoing of capital load shedding that happened early in the pandemic? I, I wouldn't describe it that way. Really what happened in the pandemic is we just had longer blankets and we're running less service and we could just take people who weren't, who didn't, there was just less maintenance to be done. They could, they could do more of it. There were bigger windows. This is, I think, more sort of a, a, frankly, overdue sort of recalibration of which budget these people should be on. Um, and it, it's not been, you know, it's one of those things where it's not been just sort of, we unload shed and then they all moved over. It's been sort of a variety of, of things over time and it's been sort of happening incrementally over the years based on the system's needs and based on sort of, you know, really who we have available at, at the time and what work needs to get done. Okay, but this was only something that you began sort of tracking on and seeing the trends several months ago, even though some of these moves were made like years ago. We've been we've been tracking the trends on this for, for some times. We for some time, excuse me, uh, for well over a year, frankly. Part of it for, for a long time was we had a very high capital vacancy rate, and so a lot of the variance we were attributing to that. And what happened in fiscal 24 is we adjusted that capital vacancy rate up to sort of account for that, and we were still seeing it. And so that was the point at which we were like, we need to, we need to dig deeper on this. It's been um, kind of a, a journey with, with respect to, frankly, lining up different data sets and getting them to talk to each other. But uh, this, is sort of, this is sort of where we are, and we're trying to obviously address it as quickly as possible. Yeah. Um, well, I just want to uh, say no other comments here. I'll just end by saying, you know, thank you. I really appreciate when um, the budget side of things would give us multiple touch points to look at something. I know this is going to come back again with, you know, some recommendations in the you know, prelim budget memo and then as we go through a budgeting process. But I, I really appreciate this chance for us to better understand because if we only wait until the budget to do all this, like, it's just too much. <laughs> so thank you so much, um, Chris, Chris, and Pam. Um, that ends the uh, administration item, so uh, President Dufty, uh, back to you. Thank you so much. Now we'll turn it to Director Ames, who's Vice Chair of the en Engineering and Operations items uh, for the next two items. Thank you, President Dufty. Um, yes, yeah, so we've got, uh, while the staff is getting up to the, to the dais here, um, we have item 11A and B. A is an action item, surveillance impact reports for multiple projects, BART closed circuit television and public emergency phone towers, and then the second item is BART employee safety update for information only. So with that, I'll turn it over to staff, 11A. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Ames. Um, directors um, presenting on the first item is Ms. Mariana Herreras. Good afternoon, directors. Mariana Vajeras, project manager with Stations, representing my colleagues in other projects. Uh, this item is to request board approval to use surveillance technology at five BART projects and one permit to enter in accordance with the surveillance technology ordinance of 2018. The manner in which BART is going to use the technologies is not changing. However, we are installing them in locations where they don't currently exist. And so we have written surveillance impact reports, uh, one per project. Pursuant to the ordinance, the board and the public were notified 21 days and 15 days prior to the board meeting date, respectively. Uh, there's no financial impact with this item, and we do have a letter of support from uh, Secure Justice. And so staff recommends that you um, authorize use of the surveillance technology. Thank you. And just to be clear, I just want to, for the public, because it, um, it's in the packet, which is a lot of different attachments, but 
you know, we have the Dublin Pleasanton access improvements. That's one closed circuit uh, television and one, um, what is this? Oh, public emergency phone tower. And then we've got uh, Market Street entry canopies. There's four stations. And we've got Balboa Park Station East Side, Improvement and Plaza. That's also, those are all getting the circuit uh, television. That's what, uh, yeah. And then we've got the Colton vent structure in San Francisco, the in station cameras, three st San Francisco stations, and in station CCTV cameras at 31 stations phased. So right now we don't have the funding, um, but as this comes about, I guess we're, we're going to see these projects back to us, or how does that work? Um, some of the projects do have the funding, and for the projects that don't, we are required to request authorization to accept the funding. And okay. so as the funding becomes available, they'll be phased. All right, sounds good. All right, with that, I'll turn it over to the public before I turn it over to the board. So do we have any public? I didn't receive any speaker cards, but we do have a hand raise on Zoom. Yeah, okay. So we'll go to Alita. Alita, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair uh, Elizabeth Ames. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her with Team Folds. Uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, surveillance matter. Uh, I mean, this is important. I've talked about it before, and I believe I have the standing to do so. Uh, I, I reiterate to you that I am a person with profound disabilities. And uh, by increasing our coverage in areas, where the public goes and also in areas where the public doesn't go, especially for those of us with profound disabilities. Um, we need an extra set of eyes on, you know, sometimes things happen, people fall down, they, uh, you know, they, they faint and uh, all kinds of other things. And so we depend on a robust security system uh, that we can have help even if somehow we are not able to communicate uh, that uh, to those who can be of help. Uh, so I am in agreement with the basic principle uh, of this. Um, I am generally in agreement with expanding surveillance across the board. Um, uh, this is not new. Uh, new York City, they're putting cameras on the trains and uh, they're... Uh, continuing the work of cameras and stations. Uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing this uh, emergency phone tower. Uh, I, I haven't got to uh, see them. And fortunately, I've never had to use them. But uh, we need those because not everybody has cell phones. And uh, what if sometimes, occasionally, cell phone reception gets a bit spotty. So uh, these towers can be uh, very helpful. And, and that is not backward. Uh, it is complementary. Um, they, they, they can complement uh, each other. So uh, I think this is worthy of approval. I, I would have liked to have heard more, more discussion about this today, uh, because this is important that it should be stated for the record. Uh, but thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pre. Um, appreciate those comments very much. We do want to use technology. I'm in support of this. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it over. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to turn it over to the board members for comment. Yes, I just wanted, just for viewers, if you could talk about the the emergency phone towers and the experience that we've had with the trial that we've had um, in the East Bay. I'm going to let the chief speak to the experience that we have had. Uh, but we are installing a couple of new ones, and so they are emergency, and they do have CCTV at the top as well. Thank you, uh, Director. We, uh, President Duffy, we uh, installed these on a trial basis at the Coliseum Station uh, to address um, concerns that people had with the ability to, to reach Park Police on that. Uh, it's been positive. Uh, there's nothing, um, you know, out of the ordinary about the, uh, the calls that we've had on that, uh, just like the other sources of calls that people are able to do, but it does give us some extra uh, video CCTV coverage there on the platform at each of the locations where those towers are at. So it's, uh, I believe it's a positive for public safety in those areas. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we have Director Rayburn. 
Thank you very much. Um, during our lobbying in Washington, D.C., we presented to several uh, departments uh, a smart grant request for unmanned aerial systems. And that, to my mind, falls under the surveillance and use report. And I would want to encourage that we, uh, if you haven't already begun a pre preparation of such a document, that we get that prepared for adoption. Um, with that said, and I'll take any response that you have, Chief. Um, yes, uh, unmanned aerial uh, vehicles are covered by the surveillance ordinance, and uh, staff will be preparing information on that should there be a project that requires it. Excellent. And I'll move approval on this item. Motion from Rayburn and second by Jeff D. All those in favor, I guess we will take the vote. Oh, April, you'll take the we'll vote. We'll call the roll. Thank call you. The roll. Director Simon, Director Allen, Director Ames, yes. Vice President Foley, aye. Director Lee, yes. Director McPartland, aye. Director Rayburn, yay. Director Saltzman, yes. President Dufty, yes. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Oh, that was fast. Thank you. Well, I guess we're all in favor of surveillance, aren't we? <laughs> um, so now we're going on to the next item, 11B, BART Employee Safety Update, and this is for information only. Good afternoon, Directors, Deputy General Manager Michael Jones. Uh, at the last board meeting, uh, we had several uh, concerns uh, raised by our labor partners uh, around employee safety, uh, and we were asked by the board that we bring back an update on what we're going to be doing in the short, medium, and long term to address those things. So I have uh, the Chief Franklin here, the, the uh, infamous Chief Franklin. I have uh, Deputy Chief Vogan, and then I have the Chief of Staff, uh, Olivia Jackson, here to present to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, directors. Uh, Kevin Franklin, Chief of Police here to provide an update to the board about the district's efforts to respond to the concerns of our employees working in Oakland and other areas. The security issue that exists in many communities surrounding our stations is a problem that is bigger than BART, but we can play a role in helping to improve the situation to mitigate the impact to our employees and operations. Many employees have expressed real concerns for their personal safety when commuting to and from work, and we will discuss the ways that we are assisting our employees with addressing those concerns. The safety of our employees is of the utmost importance to BART, and we are taking proactive steps to build upon our commitment to safety. Keep in mind that the strategies that we are discussing today were designed to complement and overlap each other to provide solutions to meet the varied schedules of our operations staff. In addition to the recent security enhancements around our facilities in Oakland, we have also been responsive to prior employee feedback for additional security, such as coordinating with the transportation department to have a police officer assist the opening station agent at stations with security complaints, deploying the observation towers for employee parking lot and facility security, and improving gates, fencing, lighting, and CCTV where needed. <laughs> Here at the BART headquarters building, we are providing an enhanced presence of uniformed BART police personnel along with high visibility deployment of marked police vehicles. A police officer is currently assigned to fixed post duty overnight. Community service officers provide a security presence during the day. And we are providing a work location in the building so that officers who work in the Oakland area can come to the building for report writing during their shift which also provides additional visible presence of uniforms and police vehicles in the area. Keep in mind that the hours for the fixed post officers and CSOs are aligned with the availability of the shuttle service, which begins at 4 p.m. BART employees also have access to the services of the Oakland Uptown Ambassador Program, who are available to provide escorts to and from the headquarters building. Buddy escorts are just a phone call away for employees who wish to schedule the service for individuals or groups. The Oakland ambassadors are available in addition to the fixed post BART police presence and extend beyond the hours of the shuttle service. The BART Joint Union Management Safety Committee has also approved a new conflict management and de-escalation training course for all employees, developed to reduce the number of assaults on BART employees 
The safety training is a risk reduction initiative that was approved both by the committee and the executive team. The training is mandatory for all district employees and is currently available on our online training platform. To ease the burden on our police patrol staffing, we are working with the BART Police Officers Association to develop a program that would allow recently retired police officers to work for BART and provide security on streets and sidewalks around the headquarters and other BART facilities. <coughs> we are working on several initiatives for employees at BART headquarters and the Met Building, including shuttle buses, walking groups, and participating in regional collaboration with employees, employers and the City of Oakland. These initiatives are in addition to the BART Police presence and the Oakland Ambassador escorts. For employees working at BART headquarters, a shuttle will be available weekday mornings and evenings to provide secure transportation between the 19th Street Station, local parking areas, and the headquarters building. The shuttle hours are aligned with the BPD presence and are supplemented by the availability of Oakland Ambassadors for escorts. For employees working at the MET building, a shuttle will be available weekday mornings and evenings to provide secure transportation between the Lake Merritt Station and the employee parking area. The proximity to BPD headquarters provides additional presence and availability for BPD escorts to and from the MET building. BART is working on secure parking options near the headquarters building for employees who work on weekends when staffing levels are reduced and the shuttle service is not available. To accommodate employees coming to and from the building outside of the hours when the shuttles are running, BART will establish designated meeting times and locations for groups who wish to walk together. These walking groups will be available at BART headquarters and the MET building. Employees may also request an escort from the Oakland Ambassador or the BART Police Department. BART is also at the forefront of external discussions about ways to collectively address the public safety issues in Oakland. Since January, the general manager, chief of police, and the external affairs assistant general manager have met with Governor Gavin Newsom, local elected officials, business leaders, community-based organizations, and regional law enforcement agencies on public safety strategies to ensure the public safety of BART employees and riders. Executive leaders from major companies and agencies located in downtown Oakland have established a working committee to collectively implement public safety improvements. The general manager is a leading member of the committee. BART is working with the City of Oakland on several initiatives for security around our facilities, including permitted street parking for employees, restoring prior street closures to limit vehicular traffic on Webster Street, and improve street lighting for pathways to and from the BART Police Headquarters, sorry, the BART Headquarters. BART Police continue to respond to requests for assistance to our 911 emergency line, direct phone calls to BART Police Dispatch, SMS text messages, and the BART Watch app. BART Police are also available 24-7 for safety escorts when needed. Finally, we are also providing educational information with smart safety strategies for our employees to improve their safety and security wherever they go. Together, we all play a role in keeping BART, our employees, and our riders safe and secure. With that, we're available for any questions. Director Andrews. Thank you, Chief. Oh, yes, sir. If you would allow, I'd just, I'd just add a couple of uh, comments to uh, Chief Franklin's presentation. So the walking groups are in addition to the shuttles. We are obviously promoting walking. Uh, and so th they will be going in concert with the shuttles. The shuttles are to, in response to some of the concerns that we've heard. Uh, and we're going to be doing the shuttles on a trial basis. We obviously would, would prefer that our employees group and walk together. Uh, so just to clarify that. And then the weekend parking is just for individuals who are here on the weekend uh, and can't secure parking on the street. And so the way we envision that working uh, is they'll pay a daily rate behind the building here and then they'll re request reimbursement. We we're not looking to, you know, long term uh, make a commitment uh, by BART to, to parking in downtown Oakland. I just wanted to clarify those two things. Thank you. Chair. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that clarification. Um, I guess we will op we will open this up to public comment. I have two commenters here. Two. I have um, Olivia. Did I get this right? Is Spicer? Spicer. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing. Olivia Spicer. Oh, there's. Thank you.
Thank you. You're welcome. Well, welcome back. I was here last month. Uh, last time I was, I was given a different type of speech. Today, I just want on behalf of the board, President Duffy, the whole entire board, the general manager, deputy general manager, the police officers, I want to thank you this time. I'm thanking you because for the first time in almost 30 years here, I felt like I've finally been heard on my behalf and my colleagues. So I want to thank you for that. I want to let you know that I appreciate everything I, you guys are doing for us right now. Um, these strategies are what you plan on doing. It's now really good to me. And I want to thank the police department um, specifically. I called 30 minutes before I'm off, and they are here. Sometime I've had three cars show up, five cars show up, but they are here, and I want to thank you for that. And they've all been um, understanding. They have, um, haven't given us any back talk about it. They, you know, they know that we needed them, and, you know, and I look out for them, too. I don't want any of them having to go back to their vehicles or whatever they have to do by themselves because I care about their safety as well. But um, they have been very, very supportive. I don't know all their names. I remember there was the officer Kelly, a uh, couple of few others, and they are very attentive to our need. And I want to thank each and every one of you for what you have done to help us. Um, also, just an example, I think two Fridays ago, they usually come in the cars with the lights on. Well, this one particular Friday night, and it was raining. They weren't here yet, which is okay. I get off at 9 o'clock. They're usually out here way before 9 o'clock, but they weren't here on this particular Friday. So my coworker said, well, Libby, I'll just take you to your car. And I said, well, okay, let me call and let them know, you know, stand down. I'm going to get a ride to my car. Well, with that being said, as soon as we got to the light there, I see two officers coming up. I said, wait, Andrea, wait a minute. I think they're coming. They came. They said, are you Olivia? And I said, yes. They were very, very apologetic. They said, you know what? We were at 19th Street. I didn't have a vehicle, but they told us to walk up here if we had to in the rain. So I just want to applaud you all for what all the efforts that you're putting toward this. And I know that, you know, something is going to be done and I feel like something is being done. So again, I want to thank each and every one of you who have any type of hands in doing this. Just thank you on my behalf. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Olivia, before we step away, can yes. we just thank you also for coming thank and you. speaking so thoughtfully about things? And I hope thank that you. your friend and colleague is doing better. And oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you for advocating for your peers. Thank you for reaching out to me the next day too. Like I said, I finally felt like I'm being heard and you guys are really, I really appreciate everything you're doing to help us out. So thank you, thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Um, wow. Uh, next speaker is Jesse Hunt, representing ATU 1555. Good afternoon, Bar Board, uh, President Dufty, uh, General Manager Powers, uh, Executive Team. Um, I'm here also to echo uh, our, our uh, appreciation for some really good first steps um, to the police department, to Bob, your staff. Um, and, and all of the um, board of directors who've reached out um, and, and put some attention to this. Uh, um, as I said, I think we've made some really good first steps and, and certainly some immediate improvements in the BHQ area. We're still working with transportation to address some of the broader concerns and make better use of our staffing. Um, so I'll, I, I will, you know, um, hope that we can continue to have your, your support to, to make some of those things happen and, um, and you know, so we can reach out to the broader scope that our, that our um, employees in the front lines um, are still are still dealing with. So uh, just thank you very much. Appreciate it, everybody. Thank you, Jesse. I, I just want to thank you also for bringing some of your colleagues out at our last meeting, and I think it was extremely helpful. And I, I just want to offer to our deputy general manager and the chief that as it relates to the Oakland improvements and parking area, if it behooves us to have either Oakland directors or I would be willing to go to a committee meeting or a parking and traffic meeting at Oakland to advocate for it because it is extremely important. So, you know, I, th I think any of us would be willing to come and participate and, you know, show that this is something that all of us agree on here. So thank you. Thank you very much, President Dufty. Um, and I'll just say that I know myself and, and another of the union leaders also, you know, would, would happy, happily, you know, go to the uh, Oakland City Council and see what we can do to help you know, get some of these improvements that we need. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. There's, it's a lot different uh, this meeting than it was before. So <laughs> there's a lot of work that's been going on behind the scenes. Um, 
And now I will turn it over to the directors, and we have uh, uh, Director Saltzman. Director Ayers, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Oh, sorry. I apologize. We have other speakers. Yes. Um, so going now to Zoom, we have one hand raised on Zoom. So Alita, please go ahead. Uh, thanks again, Chair Liz, Liz Ames. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her with Team Folds, representing Skirt Folds. Um, so this is important, and um, I want to see this inclusive. Uh, and I did hear uh, Chief Franklin mention riders several times, which is good. Um, I don't want this type of a area security program to be employee only. Uh, I did once get to use a, uh, have an escort from the Bark Building where you're at to the 19th Street Station uh, after an evening meeting. And I have been offered it several times. Uh, and so sometimes I use it, sometimes I don't. If I go in a different direction and it's not available, well, that's on me. Uh, I hope that as we clarify this program that it doesn't become exclusive where my use of the escorts to the 19th Street Station will be, with, will be withdrawn because I'm not employee of BART. But I still have standing on this even though I'm not employee of BART. So how can we offer this and keep in mind those of us who are not employees of BART who are visiting the, the BART building on BART business such as going to your meetings that we will also be included in this uh, because you know, I'm a person. doesn't matter if I'm an employee or not. I'm still a person going between the BART building and the 19th Street BART station. So I ask that you not forget about the riders and I don't wanna see this turn into checking people uh, for having BART employee IDs and because I don't work for BART, somebody says no. So I ask for you in this to be inclusive, uh, to remember all of us who engage uh, with BART, especially people like me uh, who are different and wear a skirt. We're, 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 at, we're at a higher risk. So I don't want the, the BART police work that we're doing to improve security in the neighborhood to be the equivalent of a private security service for BART employees because BART police is about serving the people and I'm one of the people. So this isn't just for a specific group, but I want this to be framed in the ideal that BART is the people system. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dupree. That really was you know, insightful that we do have other customers out there that need this equal protection. So that resonates with me, but I'll turn this over to Director Saltzman as she's the first director that would like to speak. Thank you. Um, I wanted to thank staff for all your work on this and thank our labor partners for bringing this to our attention. And I think it's so important to keep employees safe. And also as Alita noted, it's important to, to have a balance here and make sure we're doing things that increases public safety for everybody at the same time as we're protecting our own employees. Um, so first on slide 11 on this public safety coordination and collaboration, I noticed very conspicuously the city of Oakland and the county of Alameda are not part of this partner list. So I don't know, it sounds like this is pretty new, this work, but I think it would be good to get those folks at this table. Um, just wanted to know about that. I can tell you that yesterday I was at a meeting with Chief Darren Allison from the Oakland Police Department and Sheriff Yesenia Sanchez, and so both the county and the city have been represented at many of the functions that we are working with. Great. I think we should identify that publicly then, because I think anybody looking at this might think, what, what's going on here? Um, and on that note, you know, some of the things we're pursuing, especially the street closure and the lighting, I think it would be smart to engage the local council member, Carol Fife. These are issues she works a lot on um, and they affect not just safety from crime, but safety from cars, people walking and biking. Um, there's a lot of speeding that goes on down that street and not all of them are intending to commit some other crime, but they're committing a crime by speeding and they could hurt or kill somebody. So. Um, I don't know if we've engaged with Council Member Fife yet on these issues, but if not, I'm happy to make the connection. I'm sure Director Simon would as well, but we, we are working through the Councilman's office and Rod has been in contact with them. 
fantastic. Well, let, let me know how I can help with that, if at all. Um, I think everything that's planned on the walking front and the, you know, helping with the opening of stations and the lighting, all of that stuff sounds really great. I am more concerned about the shuttles for a couple of reasons. One, we're a transit agency. Um, it's, you know, important for people to get around. We, we've prioritized people getting from our stations by walking and biking. I think we need to model that. Um, it is a pretty short walk. Again, we need people to feel safe. So I think the, the walking groups, the ambassadors who are already there, the police escorts, all of that's good. Um, but I also want to think about where this is down the line in six months, in a year. If BART has its own shuttle and all these other companies we're working with, they each have their own shuttle. There's a Port of Oakland shuttle and there's a Kaiser shuttle and there's a Clorox shuttle. And all of the major employees have all or employers have all their employees coming to work in private shuttles, where does that leave everybody else in downtown Oakland? All of a sudden, there aren't very many people on the streets. I mean, these folks employ a lot of people in downtown Oakland. So you take all those people not walking on the streets anymore, it will impact safety or at least the perception of safety in downtown Oakland. So I just think we need, I understand this is temporary for now, but as we move forward, I just think we need to be really careful um, I don't think that's the future we want to create in Oakland. You know, we were talking before about the ballers, and, and I loved what, what um, they said about, you know, the bringing the people together, and this, this doesn't do that. Um, so I just, I, I know there's kind of emergency measures, but I just want us to be thoughtful as we move forward in the future to make sure we're enhancing the overall safety of Oakland at the same time we're enhancing the safety for employers, employees. And my understanding is that the, the ambassadors, that the downtown business improvement district funds, they're, they're not totally utilized. They're a bit underutilized, so they could be utilized more. But I think if they were fully utilized, I'd rather us put the funding for a shuttle into giving some money to them to have some more ambassadors. You know, again, we're still keeping our employees safe. They're still with somebody else. But that enhances the safety for everybody, even for the people who aren't walking with the ambassadors, because there's more people walking around. It's, it's just good for safety. Um, and I'll just end with, you know, what we did with shortening our trains, I think was really smart. I was skeptical at the time, but you know, when I rode BART back from, from Coliseum Station last night after flying in, it felt really safe, because there were lots of people on the train. But when it was empty, it didn't feel as safe. Same thing on the streets of Oakland. So, just as we look forward beyond these emergency measures, I just want to make sure we keep all of that in mind. Thank you. Dur Director Saltzman, if I could just briefly respond. I, I think, not I think, I agree with everything that you said. Uh, I think this is an emergency measure to try to get, you know, our employees, you know, spoke out and they uh, requested that we do something and we had to respond to it. Um, in the sh very short term, we are working with those entities to try to, you know, cor uh, coordinate our efforts so that everyone's not running shuttles. Uh, but we are leaning towards more of the walking and the buddy program as well as the, the escorts. And, and I agree with you. There is some there is some um, um, uh, availability from I was with the CEO of District Works last week, who runs the bid. There is some availability with those ambassadors. So I will reach out to them and make sure that we're. We're coordinating on those efforts as well. Great, thank you. Thank you, uh, Director McPartland. Thank you very much. A whole pile of uh, work. Uh, you haven't let a lot of moss grow in your shoes in putting this together. Uh, congratulations and thank you. Thank you very much. I do have a, a couple of questions uh, uh, on page two, uh, just out of curiosity. Uh, is that supposed to be a uh, patrol site uh, inside a caged area uh, on top of stilts that look like they've been hit by a Mack truck. That's our uh, portable aerial observation tower that allows us to raise that in parking lots or other facilities to have a, a uh, high view. And so it's a uh, <coughs> little device that we've had for a few years. It's very good for kind of uh, providing that. Okay, uh, back to the presence. Mack truck part. Uh, you put a guy in that thing? Yes, it's uh, rated to have a person in it or it has uh, tinted windows. So uh, you can't tell if someone's in it or not. You may want to have some of our engineers take a look at that. Um, Timelines associated with it. Well, uh, first item up, 
You mentioned something about some training online. Is that the mandatory training for all, all the BART employees that you were talking about? Yes, there's uh, online uh, de-escalation training that's uh, recently been uh, rolled out to the district as mandatory training. Uh, I can't speak for the other directors, but I'd like to take that training myself. I thought of that when I read the report. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that's okay. Uh, the uh, uh, two more questions. Uh, uh, assuming you end up getting the the approval for this, um, uh, what would be the cost and what would be the timelines associated with that? Cost and timelines associated with uh, what are we talking about? Um, the uh, additional personnel and staffing that you would end up uh, having for uh, adding high visibility patrols around the area of BART headquarters and and uh, uh, being able to uh, what would be the budget for those things and those activities to include the uh, employee training, unless all of the employee training is going to be online, uh, in which case that would be a little bit easier. Uh, Director McPartland, I, I assume you're asking about the retired annuitant program. Is that the one you're referring to now or the de-escalation training? The, uh, uh, all of the above because uh, uh, how many people are you going to hire as far as staffing these positions are, con are concerned? Do you need any staff and additional staff? It, you may be able to do it with existing resources to implement this thing. I uh, don't know the answer to that, but uh, if you're going to be boosting your staff, then uh, what are the, the costs associated with that? Just ballpark stuff. I'll jump in just to uh, Director McPartland. So, the police officer, the uh, CSO and the police officers that, assign, that are assigned to BHQ are part of the regular detail. So now granted, we did have to pull them from other patrol activities to, to do that, but it's time that they would have been investing somewhere else in the system. The training, you are correct, the de-escalation training is currently online, so it's um, uh, you know, at the employee's convenience. Uh, and I don't know if there's a, uh, a pay associated with it, but if there is pay associated with it, it was part of the regular earnings. Uh, anyway, so I don't think uh, the shuttle is, is de minimis at this point. I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of, of uh, $20,000 for three months. Um, don't hold me to that number, but we're trying to do this without expending um, an exorbitant amount of resources. So for all practical purposes, uh, uh, you can implement when you get the green light and you uh, end up doing all the adjusting, you can end up... Um, and this is in the form of a statement, but it means a question. Uh, you can do it with the uh, existing resources. That's correct. It's, uh, it's it already happening. The pro happen. Yeah, the, the CSO's out there right now. The police will be there at uh, 2230. Yes, sir. They're, they're, it's part of the regular shift. They'll be there from uh, 1030 at night until 7 in the morning. Uh, part of that is uh, removing them from their regular patrol duties elsewhere and, and staging them here. But given the fact that the trains are running at reduced uh, hours at night, that's, that allows us to do that. Uh, again, uh, it doesn't get any better than this. Thank you. I like it when you're happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, Director Foley. <laughs> thank you, Vice Chair Ames. Um, first off, thank you. You have responded to Chief Franklin and your staff. Um, you responded very quickly to this ask, and it is really appreciated. Um, the work of the general manager's office, your work, um, labor, and our employees for raising the issue. I, I really appreciated how this process really <coughs> came together, where something was identified, and you folks jumped into action and came up with a very thorough plan on how do we address it in the short term, and kind of looking on the horizon, you know, what does it look like down the road? So kudos, fantastic, thank you for that. Um, thank you for protecting your coworkers. It's very much appreciated from this director, as I imagine every other director up here. Um, I had one question though, on slide three, which is the boosting our visible presence, you talk about the CSOs um, covering weekday shifts. What happens on the weekends during the day shifts? How are the folks that need to report here um, covered, if you will? So uh, let me just say uh, that your appreciation extends to everyone who worked on this. It was far beyond the police department and greatly appreciated, you know, Office of External Affairs, Operations, General Manager's Office, everyone. Um, team effort. 
for weekends uh, because staffing is reduced. Uh, that's why we're, we're uh, implementing the option to park uh, close to the building so that people have a shorter distance to travel. Uh, BART police do have availability for escorts on an ad, as needed basis, as do the uh, Uptown Oakland ambassadors. They're around on weekends as well. Super. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Foley. So I, I believe that's all we have for questions. Oh, Dr. Yes. Lee? Thank you so much. I or do you? you no. Uh, you please. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just want to say thank you to staff. I think the rest of my board colleagues, I think, provided enough comment. I share a lot of the similar sentiments of, like, thank you so much for BPD and, you know, RGM, DGM for really stepping up and hearing the concerns and coming up with solutions right away, which are not free, as, you know, Director McPartland is alluding to. Um, but this is what our employees need, and you know, I, I hear what Alita, our public commenter, is saying, but we have a unique duty and charge to protect our employees first and foremost, and um, I, I really appreciate the efforts to get there. I do think that at the end of the day, this is really a city of Oakland issue, and if, from where I sit, if the city of Oakland was taking these concerns really seriously, then we would be in a different position, but unfortunately, you know, it's on all of us as either government agencies or companies to find our own solutions, which is both not ideal and not really benefiting downtown Oakland. So as there are points of leverage, points of advocacy to make those changes in the downtown area, like I don't know what that is, um, but you know, there, hopefully there is some long-term solution. But thank you so much and really more than anything, Olivia, and uh, Jesse and you know all of our BART workers, thank you for taking the time to really elevate this issue. Okay, um, just finally, I, I do agree with Director Saltzman, like we need to come up with a more holistic plan. I do agree with the short-term improvements. It's just that we need to get the employers on the same page. Maybe we can collaborate with the shuttle if this goes on longer than three months because it's not going away. So I think we need a whole more holistic view of including the public with the idea that we do more buddy programs and not so much shuttles. And then if we decide to do lighting in this street, then what about the other streets? I mean, so it just, it just could, it just needs to look balanced for the whole community as well. But thank you for this presentation. It was very thoughtful and I hope that we can make it more broad based. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. I, I do want to say that I think that one element of this is that BART is creating a toolbox. We're going to figure out what works and what doesn't work. This is not something set in stone. This is an informational item. And I, I know all of our, my colleagues here did speak to um, how wonderful it is to see a response that came about so quickly but I'm also pleased to see that there's a lot of flexibility because some things may work very well, some things may be, don't work at all, and some could be tweaked in some ways. So um, I think that the, the, the bottom line is that uh, the rapid response, the robust toolbox, and I know we'll be hearing more. So I, I wanna thank everyone for this and thank you, uh, Director Ames, for chairing this item. Um, colleagues, we're now going to combine um, board matters, uh, board member reports, roll call for introductions, and in memoriam requests. And I'm going to start with Director Ames and then move um, to, to Director Rayburn. I just want to thank everybody for involving me with the DC trip. It was fabulous, and I have nothing to report. I've already done that earlier. Thank you. Um, I don't have anything to report, and this is not an RCI, but it's kind of an FYI that I'm going to be working on a couple of changes to our board rules based on something that came up with the DC trip and made things challenging for staff and board members. We haven't updated our board rules, I think, since like 2014 or something was early when I got on the board. So I figured I'd just look at the whole rules and see if there's other stuff that's out of date. So if any board member it can't be four of you, but if a couple board members are interested, let me know and we can work on them together, but obviously we'll come to the full board. Thank you. Thank and you. I'm going to, oh, oh I, you, I didn't yeah. speak, I'm sorry. Just two quick things. Um, for those that are uh, paying attention at home, 
or, or not. Um, this Tuesday, the 19th at 6 p.m., the Concord Community Reuse Authority, huh? the Concord Naval Weapons Station, basically, uh, term sheet is going to be considered by the City Council. Uh, this is Brookfield's um, proposal to develop that land, which is adjacent to our North Concord Station. So it is a big deal, and for those that want to play along at home and watch, uh, you can zoom into that meeting remotely. Um, and the second item is for, uh, for Rodley and his shop, if you will. Um, I would like to ask that we start looking for some grant funding to look at designing platform screening. I know that we are a ways away because of the TC, the, the uh, computerized, uh, excuse me, uh, CBTC, right, thank you, thank you. Uh, train control. And so I, I know that those need to go hand in hand, but I think in advance of that, trying to find m uh, funding that may be there for us to look at design would be important. Um, so I would just like us to, to maybe take a peek in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I just want to take a moment to uh, just say how important it is that our meetings are televised. And I want to take a moment to thank the team that puts this together, our board meetings, our committee meetings, uh, the accessibility that the public has through Zoom, not even to have to be here in order to ask questions or to challenge our work. So I'd like to just, on our medium and communication staff, I'd like to thank Cheryl Stalter, communications officer, Steve Connell, multimedia producer, Anna Duckworth, communications officer, and then from the IT staff, Travis Engstrom, director of technology, Bode Karim, who's the supervisor of business systems operations, Tom McDonald, computer support coordinator, Scott Hansen, computer support coordinator, Dave Devana, cybersecurity engineer, Alonzo Rigel, uh, executive assistant, and Jeremy Amato of One Workplace. And so I just want to take a moment to thank all of you that the public doesn't get to see, but you make it all possible. Thank you. And, uh, Director Lee, uh, Director Rayburn. Thank you, President Dufty. Uh, in my uh, board report, I want to share that I attended the Hayward State of the City address hosted by President Sandine at Cal State East Bay. I was joined by Bradley Dunn on BART's staff, Mayor uh, Sol Mark Salinas was uh, effusive in his generous comments uh, praising BART and um, he likes to refer to Hayward as the education city. Um, my hope is that we can bring parts of the campus closer to the BART station. Of course, I also attended the legislative trip to Washington, D.C. I want to turn to an in memoriam. And Marilio Leon was a leader of the Tenderloin Neighborhood Development Corporation. He was the executive director, very respected. On February 23rd, I was walking through the Fruitvale Station and there was a group of police cars. And I asked one of the officers what the incident was and I was told that we had a passenger collapse on the platform. And he also shared that that passenger died uh, either in transit to the hospital or at the hospital. Marilio's loss extends to the East Bay where many were saddened. Chris Iglesias, the Unity Council Executive Director, called me several days later to inform me that the man's name was Marilio Leon, who had served as the vice president uh, of the Oakland or Fruitvale Unity Council. He had actually filled in during Gilda Gonzalez's sabbatical as the chief executive officer. I had another call from former council member Abel Guillen who shared with me that the family was very sad and they were 
perplexed over what had actually happened. I called on Chief Franklin and his officers to investigate and provide some consolation that there was no foul play involved. They wanted to look at video and that's been arranged. Marilio is an incredible individual that we've lost. Um, his family, they were farmers in Chico. And Marilio moved through the education system to graduate from Harvard's Kennedy School of Public Policy. We've truly lost someone who contributed to the community that was loved by thousands. He touched many lives. And I want to share abrazos a todos, my hugs to family and friends. And may he rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. And with that, we've completed our agenda for the day and our meeting is adjourned. Recording stopped.